This is dedicated to the homies that was down since day one. Welcome to Drop D. Welcome to Quick Hits, a JFK assassination news and notes podcast brought to you by your hosts, Rob Clark and Doug Campbell. Hey, 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 hello and welcome guys to the crass yet highly informative Quick Hits, a JFK assassination historical research news and notes podcast. I am 50% of your assigned hosts, Doug Campbell. Please join me in welcoming the star of the show, Big Bad Bob, Rob Clark. What up, homie? Yo, what's up, Doug? Ah, man. Feels like we just did this, man, but um, I'm glad to be back so soon. I love it. Yeah, man, we uh, we just found ourselves with a lot to talk about and bumped it up a week, and here we are, man, uh, right on the heels of the latest The Lone Gunman podcast, which was a great one. We'll get into that uh, a little bit later in a later segment of the show, but it's good to talk to you, brother. Very good to talk to you. Yeah, buddy. Uh, we're going to have a good one today. I can't wait. And uh, uh, there was also a uh, Locals exclusive podcast dude, dude. Uh, this week as well. <laughs> I was gonna. I, the next thing out of my mouth, homie, was uh, that I heard your special uh, uh, from uh, TLG. You and you and Joe, y'all been knocking it out of the park lately. But that that was a very interesting show. Uh, uh, you know, a, a guy a guy at work who watches a <laughs> there's there's a guy at work that he's a he's a YouTube University student, right? And he actually asked me about the Mossad thing like a week and a half ago. Like, do you think it was because he he looked at me like, so you don't think it was because Kennedy, uh, and I'm like, nah, dude, nah, it's fiction. And then, then oh boy, dude. Oh boy. I don't know what else to say, man. Hey, look, you know, you would think people would know by, by now that, you know, when you, when you try to come at your boy, (laughs) hey, look. In the immortal words of Wu Tang's Raekwon the Chef, Doug. Whoever's discrediting a nigga credibility, you better be credible. <laughs> Fucking A, brother. Fucking so A. So, Corey Hughes, yeah, take yeah. that shit to heart, son. Stay in your lane. Yeah. Okay. Keep hanging out with your little baby group over there. And, uh, you know, uh, keep my name out of your mouth son dude toy research it's too easy <laughs> it's too easy I, yeah i use the phrase toy research you know but this is like um yeah. you know this is like the latest uh you know pro proudy blog post from over there you know what i mean it's uh from from up there rather it's it's the toy that toy research plays with basically um <laughs> yeah it's all like it's say. like fishing in a barrel yeah you know, you go, you're going to get got. Oh, exactly. Ain't nowhere to hide, son. Exactly. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. But, uh, yeah, man, I dig the uh, I dig the Raekwon quote. The man speaks a lot of wisdom. If you let if you listen to that man speak, you hear a lot of wisdom. And I'm not necessarily talking about his rhymes, although a lot of wisdom there. But, man, when he speaks, uh, usually something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, hey, much like Alan Dale, Doug, who I really enjoyed on your last podcast, by the way. Oh man, thanks, dude. That yeah, that was so much fun. But yeah, when he when he speaks wisdom, wisdom spilleth spill spilleth for, fortheth. Did I say that right? Yes. <laughs> you know yes. what I'm saying. Yes, in the old Hebrew. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, don't say that, man. Now we're Mossad agents too. <laughs> Fuck, Rob. <laughs> oh man. Oh. We just can't get away from it. Boy, you messed up there. Now we'll be taking money from, uh, you know, Odd Nod, Dingleberry, or whoever the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> slightly, oh. cr- okay, I got the slightly crass part out of the way. Now we can get to the informative. Oh, Doug, did I tell you about <laughs> a new Quick Hit sponsor? 
Ar- Arnon Miltran. <laughs> oh, really? Really? Yes. That's the yes. convenience store chain, correct? Yes, we're going to be sponsored by <laughs> Tour <laughs> Tour Tour Israel. Uh, <laughs> so this, this I hear is... it's lovely this time of year. Rob, actually, yes. the sponsorship consists of a banner hung up in a Circle K in Tel Aviv. That's pretty much all it is. There you go. Yeah. Maybe they'll put a statue of me and you in the garden right next to Jesus Angleton. No, it's cardboard cutouts between uh, the vapes and the lotto tickets uh, there (laughs) of of you and I. Right by the Coke Zero display. Right, in Tel Aviv. Yeah. The unofficial sponsor of Quick Hits. Yeah, luckily... uh, I, if I were there, I could get a Coke Zero because although the label is in uh, Hebrew, it's the same color, so I wouldn't I wouldn't get confused. Um, they sent me Sweet. some screenshots of where they're going to put the banner and the cardboard cutouts of us there. Um, um, I tried to get them to put us over by the the, the CBD, you know. Uh, yes, <laughs> but they already had a cardboard cutout of MC Search there, so uh, they wouldn't. They, they would, <laughs> He's paid through the one the, drawback, Doug. He's paid through I the year. We're fucked. One so. drawback, they they they're only going to pay us in shekels. So, man, so I got to bury him in clay pots. Essentially, is what you're telling me. I got to bury my yeah yeah yeah. Mm. We're, we're gonna have to do a little conversion uh, <laughs> before we can actually spend anything. Uh, but Crypto hey, shekels. You know what? You know what? <laughs> Free Twinkies yes. in Tel Aviv. So for life. For life. <laughs> for life. Oh boy. However long that may be. However long that may be. They may. They may. Uh, they may choose to take us out because we're a security risk now. Yes. Uh, let's hope that doesn't the happen. Five eyes from five guys are watching. Always. Don't forget that. You mean like like the burger place, Five Guys? Yeah, like the Five Eyes from Five Guys oh. are watching us at all times. That's where we meet our case officer. Yes. Man. Yes, yes. Just give uh, me a big old bag of fries any day. He's a really good Peanut dude. Peanut shells on the floor. Let's go. Yeah, he's a really good dude, our case officer. Um, he is actually he the grandson of E. Howard Hunt. Um Michael Hunt, uh, we call him Mike. <laughs> yes, good old Mike. When Rob calls into God CIA headquarters, that's where we get our marching orders, right? So when Rob calls into CIA headquarters, the lady answers and she goes, uh, "CIA, may I help you?" Right? And Rob says, "Rob has to give her our kryptonym." So Rob says, "Yes, um, this is uh, ZR Magnum Dong for Michael Hunt." And then you can you can hear her on the intercom. She she pages him. She says, "I have a magnum dong for Mike Hunt. I have a magnum dong for Mike Hunt." And then and then he gets on the he, and then he gives Rob our our assignments. Paging, I need a dick. Paging, I need a dick. <laughs> All right, how old are we? I mean, God damn. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't we're know. still thirteen at heart. Man, we love it. That that is the most fun I've had podcasting in six seven years. I ain't gonna lie to you. Uh, <laughs> now that the crash shit's out of the way, Doug, yeah. I guess we can get into the more important, uh, dignified, uh, informative, research. informative. Yes. That was the it was crass and informative, or was it and entertaining, but, or was it but informative? I, I, anyway, yeah. either way, I'll take it, right? Either way, I'll take it. Uh, we do have some serious news, Rob, on the front of uh, Washington, D.C. We are going to go oh. now to the desk of a cat. Mike Hunt. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. We were there last week. We were there. We, okay. we're not, yeah, we're not doing Right back. at the top of the paper. We're, from the desk of Mike Hunt. Yeah, from the desk of Tennessee 9th Congressional District Congressman Steve Cohen. I was expecting a fucked up name, but okay. I told you I've gotten serious already. Okay. Yeah, right. I, I I'm flipped. A, I flipped. I'm the try switch, to rein dude. it in. I flipped this. No, don't rein it in. You, you Ooh. be you. You be you, dude. You be you. I'll bob and weave with you, homie. We'll go where All it right. takes. Steve us. Cohen. Steve Cohen. 
Uh, this is dated, actually. Let me go back to the other slide. February 23rd, 2024. I think like right after we recorded the last quick hits. Um, this is a press release from the website of Congressman Cohen. Again, from Tennessee. Congressman Cohen seeks release of remaining documents in President Kennedy assassination. In a letter to President Biden, it says... Oh. In a letter to President Biden, Cohen says if they implicate or embarrass the CIA, the FBI, or any other governmental agency, the public has a right to know. What do you think about that, Rob? I think it's true words. Yep. Here is the story. Washington, D.C. Congressman Steve Cohen today wrote to President Biden once again, urging him to release documents associated with the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, long delayed despite legislative mandates for them to be made public. Uh, the letter reads, in part, I write again to urge you to swiftly release all of the all of the remaining non-public documents related to President Kennedy's assassination. And this is interesting here, what he says. And I wanted to get up and clap when I when I when I actually heard a member of Congress acknowledge the point. And he's from Tennessee. Yeah, for real. And 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 he's a Democrat from Tennessee. And um, and yes, it matters, motherfuckers. <laughs> I should edit that out. I'm sorry. Uh, unfortunately, many Americans have become distrustful of the federal government. Some of this credibility gap can be traced back to the perceived cover up of the circumstances of President Kennedy's death. Congressional Republicans have further tried to delegitimize the federal government with their irresponsible and often too dangerous rhetoric. In the face of cynicism, it is essential to demonstrate transparency. The delay of the JFK assassination and Warren Commission document releases only feeds these conspiracy theories and undermines confidence in government. President Kennedy's assassination has always been the subject of conspiracy theories. The governmental secrecy and recent delay in the release of the documents only perpetuates this type of thinking, Cohen says. If the papers demonstrate different circumstances or additional actors were involved, so be it. If the documents support the Warren Commission's findings, they don't. Hell, the ones we have now don't support the fucking Warren Commission's findings, you know? That's uh, true. Or further support the work of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, so be it. If they implicate or embarrass the CIA, the FBI, or any other governmental agency, the public has a right to know. After amen. S- amen. After 60 years, it's time to quash conspiracy theories and demonstrate the federal government's accountability to the people. Well, I don't know about that. Yeah, yeah. He's still he's, he's But it's still time for the, the truth fence. to come out. Yeah. He's still walking the fence, but he did... The point, if the papers demonstrate different circumstances or additional actors were involved, so be it. You know, it's time to come out with the truth. If it embarrasses the CIA, the FBI, you know, or any, you know, so be it. The public has a right to know. And he's absolutely right about that. And um, the thing about it. And I'm going to get into this a, a, a lot deeper on the next Dallas action with uh, G- Greg Wagner's coming back on. Um, and we're putting together an outline now. Sweet. <clears throat> based on some of his analysis that he has published at um, his website, Tango Down 63, um, and how it correlates with some Bill Simpich work in State Secret as far as. Um, The motive of the cover-up being just this, embarrassing federal agencies because Oswald was their guy and he got set up and some of their people did it, not because, you know, not, anyway. Um, But I I, I love his point. You know, look, it's it's 60 years. It's 60 years. If this is going to have, if it's going to put egg on the agencies of governmental, you know, on the faces of, of governmental agencies, so be it. It's time. It's time for the truth. And I want to uh, take this opportunity, Rob, to, uh, hell yeah, uh, thank because, you. 
Yeah. Look, the, the, kudos to this guy for, for doing that for sure. Because the time of Congress actually doing their job and calling these agencies to the carpet, like happened in the seventies with the, with the Rockefeller commission. And, uh, what was that other one? The, uh, a church committee, Rockefeller church committee, committee you know, and, and the house select committee, um, those, all that's done and over with. You never hear of Congress people doing these uh, special things, calling anybody to the carpet, NSA, uh, Homeland Security, CIA, FBI, none of it. They're never held accountable for anything. When's the last time you heard the CIA in mainstream news at all, dude? I mean, you know, and it's you, like that's a good point. And when you do on the rare occasion, see some of them called up to Congress to testify about something. It's not about a legitimate security snafu or concern. It's usually for some politicized reason. You know, they're called up there to testify because somebody's trying to politicize something, not necessarily because there's an actual issue. So it's usually for bullshit, right? Yeah. 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 And there's no historic, historical significance. There's no, you know, headlines across all media type thing to let anybody know what's going on. It's all behind closed doors, this and that. It's just, you know, you would think the CIA didn't exist anymore if, if you if you really didn't go uh, searching. Yeah. And, you know, with the amount of taxpayer funding that goes that gets funneled into them, it's just... You know, they they basically have a, you know, carte blanche to do whatever they want and enough black funds to do whatever they want and yep. not have to worry about uh, repercussions, especially at this point. I mean, my God, you think things were bad in the 70s? Tack 50 years of, of, of uh, you know, the CIA doing things and honing their skills uh, to oh, where yeah. we're at now. Yeah. I mean, my God. I guarantee you the best computer people in the world work for them. Oh, yeah. 100%, right? Yeah, and the baddest operators that you never hear anything about. I mean, can you imagine, Doug, if the the actual name of a CIA uh, agent was released nowadays like E. Howard Hunt was back in the day and and, uh, David Atlee Phillips and... You know, you just don't hear about these people anymore. Yeah, that's that's happened to, you know, a few, probably less than a handful of times, you know. Um, in the last few decades, you know, you just don't hear about it anymore much. No, nah, ain't no whistleblowing going on over there. Hell no. And and you know they just didn't stop doing what they were doing. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you know. Uh they, you know, if you if you keep a pulse on, usually if there's if there's bad shit going on in another area of the world, it's usually them trying some bullshit. You know. Just, yeah. But I want to, uh, but as far as embarrassment goes, you know, I mean, we, I think we can agree that I don't, I don't want to call Oswald a CIA agent and I don't necessarily think he was a CIA operative. I think Lee Oswald was entangled with some legitimate CIA anti-Castro type shit in 63 uh, and the CIA knew he was entangled with it. Um, but I certainly don't think he was getting orders from James Angleton. I think that's that's a ridiculous notion, you know. Right. <laughs> like, like, you know, it's like, uh, whatever. Um, oh, I, he's damn sure wasn't getting orders directly from David Atlee Phillips. If you think that's going on, then, uh, man, you're it's YouTube University again. But... I, uh, yeah, I wouldn't call him a, but at the same time, they knew he was entangled with their operations. They probably used that. And in that sense, he was kind of their guy, you know, FBI too. I still think Lee Oswald was a confidential FBI informant, a hundred percent. Um, yeah, yeah. Sure. um, and a that, Im- do, yeah, paid a hundred percent. So you, you believe that too? Yeah. 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 Um, 
But I don't think Oswald was a CIA agent. Um, no. Nah, that's going a little too far. Uh, but just like Frank Sturgis wasn't a CIA agent, but did he do things for the company? <laughs> yeah, he oh, sure yeah. did. It was he was part of the you know plausible deniability thing when you want a badass operator to do something with no ties to the you know ties back to the agency, you know. The, he was an you, independent. You dealt with people yeah. like Fiorini, Oswald. Um, Santiago, uh, you know, people like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, independent contractors. Right. Yeah. Uh, and Sturgis was more more that, who was also entangled, you know. Uh, but yeah, he did have like, a Here's a briefcase full of money, and, uh, yeah, thank you for your service. To you yeah, guys. yeah. You know what? We're going to get into a, a few of his shenanigans later in the show with this uh, blast from the past from 1976 I, I found from everybody. Uh, Sweet. Uh, regarding uh, he, he and Jerry Hemming. Um, so, yeah, we're good. this is going to be uh, – we're going to touch, touch on the Interpin guys a little more in this episode than we have uh, – uh, in a while, too. But, uh, yeah, I wanted to make everybody aware of that right off the top of what Congressman Cohen did um, in the name of, let's just put it out there, it's time. Get those it files is. released, President Biden. Quit being a douchebag about the damn files. Stop it. You're better than this bullshit, Biden. You're better than this. I think that's what Cohen's saying. Anyway, if not... yeah. Then, and for any White House staffers out there that happen to be listening to this show, <laughs> look, word has it that he'll sign anything you put in front of him. So get, get <laughs> yes, the paperwork yes. together and tell him it's something uh, totally different and get him to sign to release all the files. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, yes. Tell him, tell him uh, here uh, th- that you're outlawing mohawk haircuts for any children three and under, and he'll sign it immediately. Bam. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Just tell him whatever. <laughs> Fuck it, hey. But stop it. No, I'm over here, Joe. Over here, buddy. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, so there you go. Everybody uh, uh, support uh, Congressman Cohen. Uh, he's a good dude. Um He's one of the good guys here in Tennessee, so there you go. Mr. Rob yes. Clark, BBB. All right, Doug, I got a crazy one for you. I gave you a little hint before we started here what I was going to be talking about. Yeah, and, that, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and you said, uh, well, if you, if you knew what that meant, you'd know what this meant, and I didn't know what the first thing meant. So, Yeah, and I didn't tell him either, so he's going to be learning along with the listener. I've because- never read that book. I only knew the the other reference, you know, Riders on the Storm. That's the only reference I knew. Right. Yeah. Right. And the book in question here is, that I showed him was a picture of Lee Harvey Oswald holding up uh, in the backyard photo um, along with the rifle is a copy of Aldous Huxley's, Aldous Huxley's book, The Doors of Perception. Okay? Yeah. And this photo comes from... It accompanies an article that I found from Rolling Stone magazine from the 1980s, Doug. Oh, interesting. And the byline is, New evidence suggests Lee Harvey Oswald was among soldiers given LSD in a CIA test program. So the, the, the title of the article is called, Did Lee Harvey Oswald Drop Acid? Who wrote this article? Martin, of course it's Martin. Martin A. <laughs> Lee. Of course it's Martin. Robert Rand, Randfell and Jeff Cohen. Uh, okay. So did Lee Harvey Oswald drop acid? Yeah. Is the is the the Rolling Stone article from the eighties? Yeah. Okay. And oh oh, it oh. starts off with yes. Hence the doors of perception reference. Yes, that is a book about taking LSD and opening your mind. See, I didn't know that. Yeah, man. Aldous Huxley was an old school, like, Timothy Leary type dude, you know, who was, uh, you know, uh, tripping balls back then and, and basically, you know, writing books about 
the the benefits of using LSD and what it can do for your mind. So like a like and, a William uh, Burroughs you know, type guy. Yeah, 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 for sure. Like yeah. So it's st- the article starts out with a scenario that I'd never hippies. heard before. Proto hippies. Yeah, proto hippies. Yeah. So apparently, Doug, uh, on a hot summer day in New Orleans in 1963, okay, yeah, a young man walked into the office of Edward Gillen. He was an assistant district attorney. And Gillen offered the visitor a seat, but the young man chose instead to stand across the desk from him. He had a question about a drug, one that Gillen had never heard of before. This was no ordinary drug, Gillen was told. This drug would affect the social and economic history of the world for the next 200 years. Oh, my goodness. The the young man wanted to try the drug, and that was what had brought him to Gillen. He wanted to know if the drug was legal and if he could bring it into the country from somewhere else. It was important, he insisted, speaking for the better part of an hour on the wonders of this new chemical drug. Gillen just sat there, somewhat bewildered, trying to assimilate the story. Who was this guy? What was this drug that could transform the world? Any drug that could produce the results this person spoke of, Gillen reasoned, would have to be illegal. He also concluded that his visitor was probably a bit crazy. Gillen suggested that the young man visit the New Orleans chemist, the police authority on such matters, and strongly urged that he consult his personal physician as well before doing anything further. The visitor left, and Gillen never heard from him again. A few months later, over the weekend of November 22, 1963, to be precise, Gillen came to recall that odd encounter because... President John F. Kennedy was slain on Friday, a new president sworn in two hours later, and on Sunday the accused assassin was himself shot down in a Dallas uh, basement. As these incredible events tumbled into one another, Gillen thought of the conversation he had that summer. As the details and descriptions of the life of the accused assassin became known, Gillen realized that the visitor he had received that afternoon in New Orleans was none other than Lee Harvey Oswald. (laughs) <laughs> now, have you ever heard of that story, Doug? Never. Never. I mean, this is a New Orleans assistant district attorney. Okay? This is no Joe Schmo. No. No. Uh, it's not like it's Larry Fortinsky down at the damn uh, 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 pharmacy, you know, that he walked in and asked about the drug. No. he walked... Now, I've never heard this. You know, it, it, did you... I, I tell you where I would be interested to check is like the the John Armstrong archives at Baylor University. Yeah. See if there's any mention it, it you know, or even um, um, his book. See if there's any mention of it. That's interesting. Yeah, I've never heard this before. Yeah. So the the article goes on to say that Gillen, the assistant district attorney, called the FBI the day Oswald was killed and told them that he believed Oswald had been using unusual drugs, told him of the encounter that he had with him, but the FBI seemed uninterested, and the drug lead was never pursued. Okay, so then they go on in the article to speak a little bit about, of course, the association between the agency and uh, testing of LSD, Um the CIA first began experimenting with LSD during their Project Artichoke, which was an extensive behavior control effort launched in 1951. Project Artichoke was aimed primarily at developing unorthodox methods of interrogation, including narco-hypnosis, and a combination of various chemicals when properly administered would catapult a person into a semi-conscious limbo that the agency called the Twilight Zone, Doug. Oh, the Twilight Zone. Is this, uh, I wonder if this predates or postdates Rod Serling's show. Well, it's probably contemporaneous, I would imagine. We're talking about the 50s here. Um, so not only that, but, you know, then Project Artichoke, Artichoke kind of um, 
transforms into MK Ultra, which I'm sure everybody's heard about, which is the use of um, psychedelic drugs, trying to, uh, you know, change mind. people's behavior, mind control, to do things yeah. they wouldn't normally do, mind control, yeah, Manchurian candidate type stuff, and all that jazz. Um, so we do know that the CIA was <clears throat> experimenting with and doing a lot of these things. I mean, just look at Frank Olson. Uh, you know, they uh, true stuff. Are you familiar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You familiar with that story? Um, he, uh, Hank Alberelli wrote a whole book about that. So, um, crazy stuff. Now, to tie it further to Oswald, Doug. So, <clears throat> at Suki, Japan was the site of the CIA's headquarters in the Far East, a particularly strategic location in those years that belonged, or the, I'm sorry, that bridged, bridged Korea and Vietnam. While the CIA's presence at Atsugi Naval Base has long been known for the U-2 spy flights over Russia and China, uh, an important facet of its activities has only just recently come to light since the early 50s. Atsuki served as one of the two overseas field stations where the CIA conducted extensive LSD testing. A 1953 memo stated that LSD was being stored at the Manila and Atsugi stations and that its use in special interrogations in Europe was being considered. Mm -hmm. In addition to interrogation sessions, the drug was also employed experimentally on military personnel. These tests continued throughout the Cold War decade and into the early 60s. One Marine Corps veteran who participated in the experiments at, at Atsugi recounted how two CIA officials gave him a variety of drugs and apparently tried to recruit him for CIA service. This guy says, we just want to see how you'll react. If you're going to be a spy, don't you want to be informed about every mind-altering drug there is? They wanted to find out how well you could stand up under pressure. Like, what if the KGB agent drops a tab of acid in your drink? You've got to be ready for it. It was pretty re weird, the ex-Marine explained. I'm 18 and chasing all the whores in town, and these CIA guys <laughs> are buying my drinks and paying for the whores and giving me a whole lot of drinks with lots of weird drugs in them. One of the drugs was LSD. Pretty soon, all the shadows are moving around, we're in this bar, and samurais are everywhere, and I started started to see skeletons and things dancing around. My mind just started boiling over, going about a thousand miles a minute. So, you know, in addition to LSD, Atsugi, uh, the Atsugi-based Marine was given mescaline, sodium pentothal, downers, and speed. I'm sure there are going to be some little old ladies who are going to be surprised that illegal drugs like heroin and LSD were freely used by the government. But that's the way it was. And I believe that, Doug. I believe they were uh, experimenting oh, there's, there's on our soldiers. 100%. 100%. Uh, my grandfather. My grandfather fought in World War II, right? Um, yeah. European theater. He was there for almost four years. In Europe, you know, land, landed on the beach, bro, my grandfather. And he told us about this white stuff they put in their coffee. It would make them brave. That's what they told them. <laughs> you know? It, it, yeah. Hey, but, but, you Fat know, lines will make you brave. Hell yeah, fat lines will make you brave. Amen. Amen. So I, it's not even a secret. And um, he didn't, you know... He actually didn't speak of it very often, but I heard him talk about it a couple of times, you know. But he yeah. was never like, I think it was this. He was just kind of telling us, you know, about his experiences. And uh, I think it's pretty well known. Um, um, I looked it up a couple of years ago, and yeah, it was like methamphetamine, what they were giving him. Yeah. Yeah, for real. Now, to tie this story in even further... According to James Wilcott, who was a CIA finance officer in Japan uh, at the time of the Kennedy assassination, news of the events in Dallas came as no great shock to agency personnel. First, they had expected someone to do something about Kennedy and his policies 
And second, the man who appeared to have taken the task upon himself, Lee Harvey Oswald, was no stranger to the CIA. The story that circulated among CIA personnel stationed in Tokyo, Wilcott maintains, was that Oswald had been recruited from the Marines for a deep cover operation within the USSR. With no friends in the man, or with no friends in the Marines, fleeting contact with family, and a history of moving about frequently, he would easily have been able to embark upon a secret project without attracting much attention from family and friends. The most striking aspect of Wilcott's statement was that he'd heard speculation that the CIA's recruitment of Oswald at Atsugi was facilitated by a special handle the agency had on Oswald after discovering during a routine lie detector test that he'd murdered someone or committed some other serious crime. A routine test or one assisted by modern chemistry, one might ask. So that's interesting. So, I mean, obviously, eventually the HSCA rejected Wilcott's story of Oswald's CIA recruitment um, based on lack of corroboration. But, uh, you know, the theory is out there that they possibly had something on Oswald that he may have come forth with under uh, an altered state interrogation, let's say. Well... You know who else was extremely fond of mind-altering chemicals um, was David Ferry. Oh, we'll get into him. You know, Believe years me. ago, you and I, I, you remember the we did an episode of the Dallas Action maybe five, six years ago. You were the guest with me. It was called David Ferry Known Creep. And we yes. we, we ran across this 500 <laughs> or like 500 page, just a big bundle of David Ferry files basically in one file in some of the new releases and uh, the stories of him, you know, mind altering chemicals and the things he would get into for fun while doing them will make your skin crawl, you know? Oh yes, Doug, the Uh, jizz will be flying. (laughs) You do remember that. (laughs) I want it on record that I had forgotten all about that. I Mm. forgot all about that line. Rob remember. Not I. (laughs) That's what he said. Like the guy, and I can't remember. I I could find it probably if I looked through my stuff. Oh, but, bring, it was like bring some more of the of the, these drugs, that drugs, yeah. those drugs, and we're gonna have a great time. The jizz will be flying yeah. everywhere. He was t- you know. talking about this one drug that made his, like his temperature go up to like a hundred and one and shit, and then the jizz was flying and shit. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> and so, and you know, there's that school of thought. There's there's that school of thought that David Ferry had a lot of influence over Oswald, mm-hmm. you know. And yeah. um, to be honest, I'm kind of surprised that Judith Baker hasn't already put David Ferry doped Oswald in a book somewhere. Now that I think about it, but it's I'm possible. Just, I'm just saying. Um, there's that too. But you say we'll get to Ferry. Okay, I'll be quiet. Yeah, now. they do. They do. They do touch on uh, some of that here in a minute. Okay, cool. Um. So if Oswald was sent to Russia as a pseudo defector performing some covert task for the United States, then it's quite possible that he was given LSD as part of his training because they expected him to be debriefed and interrogated by the KGB, which according to, you know, reports of his interrogation in Dallas was that he was a very cool customer. He handled himself well, um, And he basically didn't let himself get bullied around by all these different cops, the FBI, people asking him questions. And he, you know, he only answered what he wanted to answer. He gave certain answers. Some were true. Some were false. And, uh, you know, he handled himself basically like a pro in this interrogation. Yeah. So it's, it's quite possible he did have interrogation training, you know. I am convinced of it. I'm, yes, sir. I'm, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Curry, although uh, there were, I know Curry said it. Um, I believe what's his name, uh, white suit guy in the basement, he made the comment. A lot of those police officers and, and people that, that had contact with him, you know, a few of them said that, uh, uh, made that point that, nah, he knew he was prepared for this, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So. If Oswald was sent to Russia as a pseudo defector performing some sort of covert task for the U.S., 
and it's quite possible he was given LSD as part of his training. A, l- a lengthy CIA memo entitled Truth, Drugs, and Interrogation reveals the agency's pred- predilection for administering LSD to agents who were destined for dangerous overseas missions. The CIA feared that the Russians or any or somebody else could use LSD during the interrogation or as a brainwashing device and wanted their agents to be able to be aware of it and to be able to counteract it. An adversary intelligence service, in the words of the report, could employ LSD to, quote, produce anxiety or terror in medically unsophisticated subjects, unable to distinguish drug-induced psychosis from actual insanity. But as the report states, an enlightened operative, that is someone who had tripped before and was therefore familiar with LSD's properties and effects, would not freak out, maintain their cool, knowing that the effects of these hallucinogenic agents is transient in normal individuals. The question is, was Oswald one of these enlightened agents, Doug? That's a good question. Yes. For Shizzy. All right, let's see here. So it goes on to talk a little bit about MK Ultra yeah. and Dr. Sidney, Sidney Gottlieb. Very um, notorious who, guy. Yeah, Dr. Acid there. Um, they delve into a little bit of this for the uh, church committee, uh, talking about Castro and uh, some of the other things that the uh, CIA was trying to do and the use of a hypnotized Manchurian candidate to kill Castro. Um, you know, there's just a couple yeah. of the plots here. You know, we've all heard those before. Man, he threw, they threw the kitchen sink at that guy. Literally, even even tried to drop a sink on him. It missed. Yeah. Yeah. So back to 1963. In April, Oswald moved back to New Orleans where his social circle, in view of his alleged Marxist sympathies, was even stranger than Dallas. There he met Carlos Briere an anti-Castro Cuban exile with CIA connections. Oswald's, Oswald first sought uh, in, to work for Bringier, then appeared to be working against him. Eventually, the two engaged in a well-publicized street brawl and then a debate about Cuba on New Orleans radio. Joining Oswald and Bringier in the debate was Ed Butler, a right-wing propagandist for the Information Council of the Americas, or INCA a group that later sold LPs of the debate as part of its anti-communist crusade. The president of Inca was Dr. Alton Ochsner, described as a consultant to Air Force to the Air Force on the medical aid of subversive matters. The directorships of Bringier's anti-caster group and Ochsner's Inca included the owners of the Riley Coffee Company, where Oswald, the man being denounced by both organizations as a communist, had recently been on the payroll. But by far, the strangest bird to intersect Oswald's orbit was, Doug, David David Ferry. Ferry. Yeah. Eccentric in behavior, belief, and appearance, Ferry had been an Eastern Airlines pilot until he was arrested for crime against nature with a 16-year-old, young, smooth Latin boy. He was a priest in the Orthodox Old Catholic Church, a bizarre sect engaging in animal sacrifice and occult rituals. Ferry had no hair on his body. Perhaps someone had poisoned his shoes <laughs> and hmm. wore ill-fitting wigs and fake eyebrows, but that fooled no one and made a striking, if not shocking, impression on all who saw him. Although the Oswald Ferry relationship is well proven, it is unclear when it began. The House Select Committee suggested the two men may have met as early as 1956 when young Lee was a cadet in a Civil Air Patrol squadron headed by Ferry. By the time of the 63 radio debate, Oswald and Ferry were well acquainted. A right-winger who hated Kennedy, Ferry was active in paramilitary operations against Castro and claimed to have flown in the CIA-sponsored Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. Ferry was also a hypnotist and fancied himself a biochemist. He claimed to have created drugs that caused cancer, something the CIA was secretly developing, or caused heart attacks indistinguishable from natural death, as well as aphrodisiacs, Doug, (laughs) 
and amnesia inducing drugs. So that way he can keep, he can get you horny, uh, rape you, and then erase your mind and make you forget all about it. What he did to you. Wow. Yeah. What a creep. Lovely. Known creep. Yeah. Uh, at times his apartment was overrun, uh, by laboratory mice, many attributed his hairless condition to a chemistry experiment gone awry. On top of his strange habits, Ferry worked as a pilot and private investigator for Carlos Marcello, the mafia boss of New Orleans and Dallas, a sworn enemy of the Kennedys and a cohort of the CIA mafia conspirators, and according to his tax earnings, one heck of a tomato salesman. Marcelo claimed a $1,600 a month uh, income from tomato sales, but somehow had accumulated a net, work, net worth of $40 million. Government investigators contend through drugs and racketeering. Thus, David Ferry represents a nexus in the JFK murder mystery between the mafia and the CIA, drugs and the assassination. In 1967, his ranking at... Uh, premier oddball in the case was assured when he died of an apparent suicide after uh, having become a key suspect in the assassination led by New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison. So yeah, we know all that. Um, which brings us for full circle to what became or what began as a typical day uh, for New Orleans Assistant DA Edward Gillen but ended somewhere in the twilight zone with a strange visit from a young man preaching the virtues of psychedelic drugs. Gillen's assurance that Oswald had been his visitor was rejected by the FBI on the grounds that Gillen was extremely nearsighted, Doug, oh. <laughs> and, and therefore incapable of eyewitness identification. <sighs> but due to his poor vision, he had become more and more to rely on voice as a means of identification. And when Oswald's voice was played on the radio, the Inca recording previously mentioned, Gillen recognized it as that of his visitor. He claimed that his visitor repeatedly referred to an author whose books on drugs described the new world that the visitor, uh, too had foreseen the FBI in a case of, uh, literary my my myopia recorded the author's name as Huxley Huxley. Of course, be none other than Aldous Huxley, author of The Doors of Perception, The Manifesto of Psychedelic Consciousness. Apparently, he was unknown to the FBI, which is not too surprising. When informed in 1964 that John Paul Sutra had called for a new investigation of the Kennedy assassination, J. Edgar Hoover promptly scribbled on a memo, find out who Sutra is. In a slip Almost too Freudian to be believed, the FBI re memos refer to Brave New World, Huxley's pessimistic huh. novel of a drug-induced totalitarian society as this great world. Given Gillen's inability to eyeball Oswald and the FBI's blindness as to who Huxley was, it's not surprising that the Bureau's probe was inconclusive. However, had the FBI taken the credible... Or, Taking the trouble to review its own records, it would have found that during the summer of 63, Lee Harvey Oswald actually checked out several books by Aldous Huxley from the New Orleans Public Library. Well, I'll be, and, I'll be darned. And that is true. We do have his uh, public library book list that he uh, checked out, and there were, were books by Aldous Huxley, among others, like Ian Fleming and so on. So that's pretty cool because all this oh. kind of ties together. Um, they kind of talk a little bit about uh, uh, what could possibly have been going on in September of 63, which is a time period that we really don't know much about what Oswald was doing from late August of 63 until the end of September of 63. There's uh, very little information on where he was and what he was doing. So, yep. Um, again, he was more than likely in New Orleans, but what was he doing? Um, on November 22nd, 1963, 
the Kennedy administration came to an abrupt end. And on that very day, a cancer-stricken Aldous Huxley laid on his deathbed, Doug, and took a sizable dose of LSD and passed on tripping into the nether. Well, I'll be damned. Same day? Same day. November 22nd, 63. I wonder if Huxley had learned of the Kennedy assassination. I wonder if he did it like late in the evening, you know, or if it was like first thing in the morning. That'd be interesting to know. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. And it is I looked crazy. It up I didn't know that. Aldous Huxley did die on November 22nd, tripping his balls off. Man, for real? So he took yeah. a huge dose. Huge dose. Damn. He knew he, knew he was dying and just, yeah, that, because... LSD, it's not going to kill you. Nope. Uh, but it, it will take your mind off of dying, I'm sure, with the oh, massive yeah. dose. I mean, you, 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 when you see your grandmother ride a hippo over a cliff, you know, you're not worried about, uh, you know, all the bad things going on in reality, for sure. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's the way your boy's going to go. I might uh, have to find some LSD and sit on it for a while and then, when I'm on my deathbed, I just want to trip my balls into the next life. That'd be sweet. Good to know. What better way to go? Duly noted. Uh, what better way to go? How about uh, 98 years old? Uh, 98 years old. And you're with like a 22-year-old chick. Well, you could do that on acid. <laughs> it just wouldn't be real. <laughs> you, come, you, you come and go all at once at the same time. Yes. The jizz will be flying, Doug. And oh, slightly crass. <laughs> We're back to fairy's jizz. The jizz will be flying Man. in my mind. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so uh, did Oswald take LSD? What do you think? I was. Here's the thing, though. I have learned from you today. On a serious note, Rob, I've learned because number one, I didn't know what Aldous. I didn't know who. I knew who Aldous Huxley was. I knew he was a writer, but yeah. beyond that, I had no clue, no clue. Um, and I did not know that uh, Oswald had checked his books out of the library. Didn't know that. Oh yeah, library. yeah. They have. Yeah, if you if you uh, the FBI, I think had a copies of his records from the New yeah. Orleans public library. And they had a record of all the books that he had checked out. And, uh, sure enough, uh, Aldous Huxley was a couple of them, man. I tell you what, man, I, I bet you a damn good cup of coffee that Aldous Huxley's books were in David Ferry's apartment too. I bet David yeah. Ferry had, had read them. So did he, did he, did he take acid? I don't know. But the, I mean, the authors paint a pretty good portrait of what the CIA was doing at the time that they were in Exugi. So was Oswald. Uh, they were they were testing on on military folk, uh, people that could possibly be used as uh, pseudo defectors, things like that. They probably would have wanted to at least train him up a little bit in case the KGB uh, tried some of these tactics of mind control and things like that on him. Yep. If some of the things makes that, sense. Yeah. If some of the things that we believe about Oswald's situation prior to the Kennedy assassination are true in any way, then he checks, he certainly checks some of those boxes. Right. Yeah, and why would it why would right? an assistant DA make this story up? I mean, it makes no sense. I mean, it's why? just too strange to be made up. You would think that that would be something that we would be familiar with through the garrison investigation. Right. Right. I mean, but I don't, I don't know if I've ever, uh, I, want, I may check into that, see if, you know, read Garrison's books. Uh, it certainly wasn't mentioned in the movie JFK, was it? No, no, you know, but there's, no. there's lots of odd things in Oswald's time in the military, like him shooting himself in the arm. Um, him shooting into right. the bushes at nobody when he was on guard duty, you know. Like, well, <laughs> yeah. Well, you That's know, true. maybe. That's true. Maybe he was. Maybe he was seeing some shit. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like acting out of character and what pouring a drink on a superior officer's head. You know. Well, that that could yeah. be that could be alcohol too. But they said he didn't drink. 
right? So, right. Um, but yeah, for real. Uh, I what was um, but it's funny. Now you said that was an assistant DA in New Orleans. So yeah, you would think that would be something that Garrison may may have looked into. You would certainly right? think he he would certainly have been aware of it. I think you know. It might be uh, might be worth going through some indexes of some books to see what you can find or see what I can find. Yeah, you know absolutely. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. Well, Rob, thank you so much for that very informative and very intriguing article. Rolling Stone from the 80s. Wow. Um, yeah, I don't have an exact date, but that's that's when it was. That's what that's what it's from. So when you showed me that uh, photo of him holding the Aldous Huxley book. I was like, wait a minute, did he get unhol- did he get a hold of an alternate backyard photo? This is big news. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, uh, Rob, after we come back from the break, uh, you know what I've got for you, sir, and the listeners, ironically enough, an article related to the Kennedy assassination from the 1970s. Sweet. Yeah, man, which is something we try to do here uh, is go back through all the old stuff and share with listeners who... Are newer to the case. We do go back. What's to the, old is new. It was what well, once was new is now old is now new again. Uh, what he said. All right, guys, yes. we are gonna take a break because, hey, why score all our points in one period? We appear in complex structures like a pyramid. We'll be right back. Big bad Bob here with you for Silk City hot sauces. Why Silk City? Because this hot sauce comes to you directly from Patterson, New Jersey, also known as Silk City. These hot sauces are 100% natural, gluten-free, vegan, contain no chemicals, fillers, dyes, or junk. Everything is packed into recyclable glass containers because glass doesn't leach weird flavors into the product. All other hot sauces are sourced in small batches from locally bought fresh peppers. It's all about the pepper, people. Telling you. Your boy, Big Bad Bob, loves his food like he loves his women. Hot and spicy, but not so hot you can't eat them. (laughs) So, if you love yourself some sauce and you're tired of trying to transform your bland meat into something edible, with the tip of a jar, you will transform your life forever. Head over to Silk cityhotsauce.com place an order and upon checkout enter the code GUNMAN that's G-U-N-M-A-N for 20% off of your entire order you won't regret it thank me later peace and we are back Quick Hits, a JFK Assassination Research News and Notes podcast. And we're back here with Big Bad Bob, Mr. Rob Clark. Rob, i got to go backwards here in my notes to get to this next thing. Moonwalk it, brother. I am there already. Already. And uh, I did ask Annie if she was okay. She's okay. Um, (laughs) Okay, Rob, on our last episode. (laughs) On our last episode. You, sir, read a fascinating and enlightening... Is she black or white? (laughs) It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's all history. I know, man. We better better get serious. They're going to tell us to beat it. Rob, on our last episode... You're so bad. uh, (laughs) (laughs) This is too easy. Almost like one as easy as one, two, three. Doug. We could do this all day, I think. I really, I, re- I really think we could. But I'm, I'm looking through the glass at Momo, the man in the mirror, and he's going like his fingers, he's going in like, <laughs> let's go, let's go. Say, 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 Momo. I say, Rob, that on our last episode, you read a fascinating and enlightening, uh, I believe it was FBI document that established a connection between a man named Felipe Vidal Santiago and a man named Jack Cannon in the context of anti-Castro paramilitary activity in the 1960s. Santiago, of course, is the guy that you and I 
are convinced is the man we know in, in images from Dealey Plaza as dark complected man. Yes. Uh, you and I, are, that's our belief. <laughs> We're on the same page there, my friend. And let me stress, guys, in the spirit of the last episode of the Dallas action, what we know versus what we believe, Rob and I don't know that that was Philippe Vidal Santiago. We believe it was <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Yes. Um, now, the name Jack Cannon, an individual, it is an individual that was named by Rob Reiner. Soledad O'Brien and author Dick Russell in the final episode of the highly touted podcast Who Killed JFK as having been part of the Dealey Plaza hit team, a shooter, along with Herminio Diaz Garcia, Jean Swatois, yes, and Charles Nicoletti. Croissant. <laughs> uh, we'll put that in in post. Um, <laughs> Hermine, you know. For real, for real. Um, Z Unit, Project Z, under uh, General Charles Willoughby, was said Jack Cannon to be. Um, and this name is kind of out of left field, hadn't been mentioned much over the years at all, if at all. Um, but. ZR Dong. Magnum Dong. ZR Magnum Dong. Jack, Jack Cannon's kryptonym, ZR yeah. Dong. Yeah. <laughs> Rob loves that. No, that was our. That's our kryptonym. That's our kryptonym. That's what you say when you you tell them who we are when you call for our yes. orders every month. Yeah, yeah. Now this individual Jack Cannon, I was like Jack Cannon reporting for duty. Reporting for duty. That's right. Zr Magnum Dong. That's us. What do you uh, want us to talk about this month? That's right. <laughs> That's right. We'll talk about anything you want. Don't stop till you get enough. <laughs> Man, that was a thriller. Uh, it was. It was. It was. The first half was. This half, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. We probably lost a few along the way. You know? Um, but we gained some Michael Jackson fans. We did. We. Did. I thought all the Michael Jackson fans loved us anyway. Spe- oh, they should. Specifically for my ability to moonwalk back through my notes. Exactly. Yeah. Fucking <laughs> A. Uh, now, the thing is, this name's kind of new. Or, or it's not, at least the name Jack Cannon wasn't, it isn't one that's been bantied about over the years as much as names like Roscoe White and Mac Wallace and, God forgive me, James Files and, mm. and things like that. Um I, one thing I didn't like about, t- tangentially here, one thing about who killed JFK was the fact that, is that, well, you know, we don't want to commit to the mafia d- did it or, or did it this one or that one. So they kind of pulled them. They, they said, okay, we need an anti-Castro name. We need a, <laughs> yeah. we need, we can't leave out Jean Swatois. Um, and we need a mafia name. Okay. We got Nicoletti. Um. And we need a that CIA was a true man. amalgamation, as yeah, you would call yeah. that, Doug. An amalgamation of suspects. Let's just throw all the shit at the wall and see what sticks. The opposite of Occam's razor. Yes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but now, what you proved was this an individual, at least to me, because I didn't know. Other people did, I'm sure, have read these documents. Um, I actually, when you sent me the file... Because I've got so much stuff stockpiled on Philippe Vidal Santiago, I had that file. Because when I went ah. to save it, it said, you want to replace the one you have? And I'm like, wait, what? Where? Oh, I just didn't remember. At the time, it didn't mean anything. At the time, it know? didn't mean anything. I was concentrating on the paragraph in which. About Fidel. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, the paragraph. It's in the same file as the paragraph from. The FBI informant six three six three nine dash S, who in that document was MMT one. Again, MMT one is not a specific guy; it's a designation for that document. But hi, what, Howard. Yeah, <laughs> oh, he's talking about <laughs> Howard the Duck. He's been he's been watching uh, old old school movies lately. Um, 
I am not one worried one bit about that ninety year old man coming after us. Well, I, I I'm not either, but you know, um, I, I I've established a very tentative rapport for the guy. I, you know, you know, or with the guy. Hey, you know it. something crazy about that guy, Doug? What's that? Billie Jean was not his lover. <laughs> yeah, no, she was just a girl. Um, but um. Anyway, we can that can neither be, neither be confirmed nor denied. That's right. Neither one. Now, I was doing some further looking around um, after that. You know, in the podcast, Russell kind of introduces Cannon into the narrative. But I think I may have very well stumbled upon With zero context. By the way, zero context. That's right. That's that's <laughs> well a little tiny bit. He mentioned um, a coony hair. Yeah, yes. Jack Cannon was. Um, Involved with, Gen- uh, you know, uh, uh, General Charles Willoughby and part of the Z unit or Z unit. Um, right. Well, uh, but there was no context beyond that, like what the Z unit was or the Z unit was. It, the name was just kind of, and we all kind of went, wait, what? You know, because we, oh, cause we were all going, okay, yeah, we've heard of Diaz Garcia. Yeah, because yeah, that heard- was like in World War II or the 50s or something. Yeah, I, yeah. You know. And we were all listening going, yeah, we've heard of Swatwa and we've heard of Nicoletti and Canada. Oh, you know. But I think, doing a little bit of looking around, Rob, I think I may very well have stumbled upon the very moment in time that Dick Russell himself first heard the name Jack Cannon. Um, And it is contained in an interview that Mr. Russell conducted for Argosy Magazine with none other than Gerald Patrick Hemming, storied leader of the mercenary band known as Interpen. Now, some of this will be familiar to you, Rob. You know why? You know why? Ask me why. <laughs> why? Because it is uh, excerpted and quoted extensively in a resource that you and I have studied extensively over the years, A.J. Weberman's Research Nodules. Yes. The whole story about Hall, Lauren Hall and the rifle, mm-hmm. a lot of that stuff... If you look at A.J. Weberman's nodules, it'll say interview with Dick Russell. Doesn't necessarily mean, say, Argosy Magazine. But that's where a lot of this information Mm -hmm. is called. And this interview was conducted in April of 1976, even before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Um, I love looking at A.J. Weberman's nodules, by the way. Do you? I do. Are they Are they swole? They're huge. They're, they're, they're fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> they're pleasing to the eyes. Oh man! Yeah, he I don't want to know. Through the trash, they just kind of peek out from between his legs a I little bit. I don't want to know anything more than I already do about his nodules. <laughs> yeah, or his nodules. The black and white. And I, 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 and I know how you think. <laughs> or nodule scaping. I know where you're going next. Just stop right there. Stop right there. You, you stop. You've had enough. <laughs> I mean, don't stop till you get enough. That's what I meant. Um, but I, right. I did some further looking around. Now, some of this will be familiar to you, Rob, as I just said, because I'm reading that paragraph again erroneously. Let me just go ahead and move on to the next part. Um, an ex-CIA man's stunning revelations on the company, JFK's murder, and the plot to kill Richard Nixon. Yeah, you read right, buddy. You read right. That's what it says. Uh, again, so, oh, in case you guys, I, now I'm going to read from the article. So, I forgot to mention that. Uh, you ready, Rob? You ready to hear some of this? You ready to do the flashback? I'm the ready. The throwback? I love the way you make me feel, Doug. So, let's... <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> Sorry. This is going to be a long got, segment, folks. I got no backup here because I'm trying to read this, and, <laughs> and Momo is not interested in, like, messaging me titles of Michael Jackson songs to work in. I tried. He's not in. He just shook his head at me like, no. So uh, I'm going to keep on. You know something going. about Momo? What's that? You know, he, you know, he's kind of a younger guy, right? But he looks like he's yeah. like 50. Yeah. He's a, he's a pretty young thing. He, he's, he's actually 22. Pretty? No. No. 
<laughs> thing? <laughs> Fuck yeah. Look. Easy, Doug. You don't yeah. want to be starting something. Hey, but let's uh, let's get through this article. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> We can do this all day, folks. Uh, well, let, let's get into this article. It, it, it really, it's easy as ABC. It, the all right, article come on, gives, I want you back. I want you back. Come on. Did, did you just catch that one? Yeah. Did you just catch that one? <laughs> I want you back. I don't know that song. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not. <laughs> I'm about. <laughs> we've we've just about exhausted my knowledge of Michael Jackson's catalog. Well, we are the world. So pl- please are. continue. Together we are with the listeners. The world of research. Dick Russell writes, wrote in 1976. Uh, When we're more serious, guys, we do like to take these, go back into like the Weisberg archives sometimes, pull these articles out. Um, You know, the old uh, vintage research stuff, the first generation folks. Dick Russell wrote this in April of 1976 after contacting the CIA to tell them all he knew about Castro's operations. Gerald Hemming settled in Florida. There he started Interpen, a specialized group that trained embittered Cuban exiles in special Florida camps for long-range penetration and guerrilla warfare against Castro's regime. He maintained a cadre of 25 instructors, and he began a long, friendly, adversary relationship with the CIA, the mob, the Hughes interests, Congress, and many wealthy influential Americans. Jerry Hemming was around for the truth, the tumult, and the shouting, the hits, and the misses. He was an insider who knew most of the secrets and the locations of the skeletons in the closet. He has decided to talk. Now, Rob, uh, real quick, I wonder if this was his first uh, sort of interview of this nature. Uh, I would think that maybe he's such good buddies with Robert K. Brown that maybe he... Wasn't he in a Soldier of Fortune thing before that? Or am I? Yeah, he was. But uh, I don't think this is yeah. his first. No, no, you, you are not alone <laughs> in thinking that. That's good to know. Yes. That's good to know. Um, I'm praying I'm going to run across the name Diana in this article somewhere. Um, she's Argus, a dirty bitch. She's, uh, anyway, our. <laughs> Argosy. Argosy. Yes. Argosy. I'm going to say Russell because it says Argosy here. But Russell says to Hemming, you've told Senate investigators that 1963 marked a startling change in your liaison with certain groups and certain wealthy American citizens. And this change finally led to the dissolution of your group, the International Penetration Force. Can you elaborate on what happened then? Hemming says, there were a lot of weird things going on. We'd begun to encounter more and more organizations of people in different cities with one thing on their mind, initially taking care of Castro, and then doing something about the other problem. The guy in the White House. You couldn't walk down the street without running into some kind of conspiracy. I don't doubt that there are a dozen people out there who are sure they are the ones who financed the Dallas job on Kennedy. Russell, were offers to assassinate Kennedy actually made to you and your group? Hemming, rather frequently. How many? Hemming, more than two dozen. More than two dozen, guys. By organized elements that had financial backing within the United States. Russell, what kind of elements? The right wing, Minutemen types? Hemming, there might be a retired armed forces type, a guy from the Klan. There would only be casual conversations. When it came time to open up the uh, attache case with the money in it, it was usually a mixed group. Retired armed forces type. Uh, I immediately think of Walker there, Rob. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, And we know that, that Hemming... Um, uh, a great many of the anti uh, of the anti Castro exiles and Walker were all tied up with the Minutemen, you know. And you've, of course, on the Lone Gunman uh, in your archive, there are some pretty illuminating episodes on the Minutemen connections to the JFK assassination. What episode? What was the guy's name you had on Keith? Um, Keith Gilbert. Keith Gilbert. Your episode was titled "I Was There." 
And I also had the former leader of the Minutemen, Robert Taylor, on the show as yes. well, remember? Yes, yeah. yes. Guys, please go back to through Rob's archives. Listen to that. It's amazing stuff. Um, Hemming says, about that point, we would gracefully back out of it. That's when the money's, uh, the attache case is open saying, here's your money to kill Kennedy. Then we would later find out they were trying to recruit our Cuban contacts for the same purpose. And what's interesting about that is that Felipe Vidal Santiago, being a great friend of Hemming, would qualify as one of his Cuban contacts recruited for that purpose. Would he not? Si, senor. That's right. Uh, Russell, do you think it's possible that the Kennedy killing involves some of the Cuban exile community? Hemming, yes, very possible. It wasn't that hard a job. I've seen and been on the scene for harder jobs than what happened in Dealey Plaza. Interesting. You told the Senate investigators that you believed in 1963 that Lauren Lorenzo Hall was somehow involved. Parenthetically, Hall, an ex-CIA contract employee, right-wing politico and trainer of Cuban exiles for a Cuban invasion, was named by the Warren Commission as one of three men who may have been in Dallas with Lee Harvey Oswald in September of 1963. And that's the story that... um, Apparently, there was some sort of mix-up, uh, or according to the FBI, in 1964, Hall admitted to them that he was with Oswald when Oswald visited, uh, <laughs> or it might have been him who visited yeah. this. Yeah, that he was with... And then Oswald. after Lawrence Howard called him and threatened to cut his nuts off, he changed yeah. his story. <laughs> what what his story was, he said... <laughs> That it that it was he, Seymour, and Howard, William Seymour and Lawrence Howard. Right, you're right, exactly right. Yeah, who uh, who visit? They were visiting people in Dallas at the time, and implicated the th- those three guys, himself and the other two, as having been the people that visited Sylvia Odio, and then Lawrence Howard threatened to castrate him, literally threatened to castrate him, and he recanted. Right, but that. <laughs> That happened after J. Edgar Hoover made sure that that statement by Hall made it into the Warren report as a way to make the Odeo incident go away. Like, couldn't have been Oswald. This guy says it was him. And and Mm -hmm. then Hall says, you bastard, and or or, or Howard, you know, threatened him, and then he recanted. Um, But anyway... I digress. Where was I? Yeah, Hemming says, yes, the day of the assassination. This is in regard to Hall being in Dallas. I made a call to Texas from Miami, and I pointedly asked, is Lorenzo Hall in Dallas? I made the call about one thirty or 2 in the afternoon. He was there. My contact had seen him in Dallas the day before. And this is part of the part that is exerted into uh, <clears throat> Rob uh, uh, Weberman's nodules. Um <laughs> this part was, this this part was uh, very familiar to me, and I think I just did, just told you that I I am very familiar with those nodules. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> to each his own. That's right. Argosy or Russell? Why were you suspicious of Lauren Hall? Because he left Miami with the stated intent to get. Kennedy, and he had my weapon, a Johnson 30-06 breakdown rifle with a scope on it that had been prepared for the Bay of Pigs. I'd left it with a private investigator who had previously worked under agency auspices on the West Coast. Now, this is, of course, the Johnson 30-06 that, again, Rob and I don't know that it was used in the assassination, but speaking for myself, I believe... It probably believe, was. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. believe it probably was. Um, okay, Rob, here we go. And you believe Hall was directly involved. Hemming, he knew how to do the job. We discussed various techniques as part of our shooting techniques required for Havana, Port-au-Prince, and other Latin American jobs. But I think somebody was trying to put him there <clears throat> in Dallas so he'd be one of the patsies. You said that you believed Oswald was a patsy. Did you ever have any contact with Oswald? Now, this is, I guess, <clears throat> this story is later recounted famously in um, John Newman's book, Oswald and the CIA. 
Hemming claims to have met Lee Oswald years before the Kennedy assassination, even before Oswald defected to the Soviet Union. Hemming, I ran into Oswald in L.A. in 1959 when he showed up at the Cuban consulate. The coordinator of the 26th of July movement called me aside and said a Marine officer had showed up intimating that he was prepared to to desert and go to Cuba to become a revolutionary. I met with the Marine and told him he was a non-commissioned officer. And he told me he was a non-commissioned officer. He talked about being a radar operator and helped the Cubans out with everything he knew. He turned out to be Oswald. Um, now, uh, let's see. Where am I at? Mr. Rob, kind of long. Don't you look at me that way, Momo. Stop it. Uh, so there it is. Uh, here we go. He's going to get into the name Jack Cannon right here to Russell. Um, they're talking about Ruby and Ruby's connections and 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 and. Russell asks, so the mob was actually pulling jobs in Cuba before the CIA attempts on Castro's life? Hemming, let's say they all knew one another. They got along. Quite a few of the people who worked for the agency had gotten into a little trouble. They went to work for people that knew mob people or Howard Hughes people. Everybody gets to know everybody else. And Castro was getting tired of the attempts on his life. And finally, I think some of Fidel's boys had people in Mexico monitoring the JFK thing in 1963. Let's see. Where is it at? I think I skipped it. Oh, here we go. Uh, Russell, so you see a definitive role for organized crime in the picture. Hemming, look, going back to things concerning the overthrow of Batista in 1958, the mob was trying to get their boys into Cuba. Sturgis, Johnny Devereaux. Jack Cannon, Herman Marks. They wanted people on both sides with Batista and with Castro. Later, they operated the same way, trying to do the hits against Fidel through 1959 and 1960. Um, But that's 1976, April of 1976. And Hemming just sort of drops that, the name Jack Cannon, um, in the middle of a flurry of names and places and whatnot. So I'm I'm guessing that's the first the first time Russell was ever made aware of that name. Now the other name, well, you, know, <clears throat> you know what, Doug? What's As that? a matter of fact, um, and this was the mid '70s, and it's quite possible this is the first time because I I'm not, I can't remember exactly when Russell started talking to Nigel, but um, I had Carmine on on the Loon Gunman a couple weeks ago. Yep. And we were talking about uh, Jack Cannon a little bit, and <clears throat> it it <it'd> be <clears throat> what he says the first time that uh, that he saw well how how Richard Case Nagel brought the name Jack Cannon to Dick Russell. Um, it was actually you know when he when Nagel was arrested, he had a bunch of documents and papers and shit in his trunk. Remember that yeah, the, the whole story. Well, on on some of those papers, you know, he listed um, military intelligence officers, CIA personnel that he knew, and the FBI was trying to run down and match and and ask, you know, the CIA, hey, is this is this true? Is this guy associated with you? Who who are these people that are listed on these documents? And one of them, one of them on there was Jack Cannon. And of course, Nigel, being former military intelligence in the Far East, um, this guy Jack Cannon was apparently like, uh, like he re- like you said, he ran his own intelligence network over there, kind of. And <clears throat> his his basically, he was like Doctor Evil over there. I mean, he <laughs> he had this uh, he or they had uh, acquired a uh, a vast like plantation mansion house over there on the grounds that Jack Cannon, you know, he surrounded by, you know, statues and, and, you know, gold, golden things and this and that. And he actually had a golden gun that he would shoot out the window. And yeah. Fancy. And this is Jack Cannon. targets in the yard kind of thing. Yeah. And, and this is Cannon. I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't, if I, somebody that leads an intelligence network, Right, yeah. They're not gonna be the guy on the ground. 
You know, I, I, the Jack- well, this was this was like in the fifties. Yeah, but I don't. Um, you know, wouldn't he be? I don't know. I, I I'm, I'm, I'm very. Well, we do up know in the air do, about the we, name Jack Cannon, but I'm very up do, in the air we, about Richard Case Nagel too, okay. man. I, you know. Um, you know, we do know that Jack Cannon was running these these operations in in into Cuba. You know, these Cuban raids. We know he was running them. Um, same guy that was same like, guy, same guy. Yeah. Okay. So, it's not out of the realm of possibility that he would have been on the ground. Uh, you know, at certain times, because he fan. I'm sure he fancied himself a badass, uh, a dude. You know, it, it, yeah. this is the kind of life he's leading. It's just interesting that his name was among. Richard Case Nagel's effects at the time of his arrest in 1963. You know, as somebody mm-hmm. that he knew explicitly was <clears throat> CIA or, um, you know, that he would have known because Nagel was supposedly military intelligence when he was over in, in, in the Far East as well. So he would have definitely known who this guy Jack Cannon was, you know. So, that, I mean, when I ask, is it confirmed that he had the name, like, written in the notebook, it's it's like the 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 thing about him having the, the what is it, the selective service card that was Oswald's that was different. Right. Um, that's still not, I mean, I know a lot of people believe that he had it, but as far as I know, that's still sort of up in the air, like. Well, here's the difference. You know, I, I'm not. We have documents supporting. We the do fact have those that the documents F- that he with the FBI <clears throat> is, is is investigating these names in the Gell's notebook. Okay, cool. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah, it was in a notebook, and we have docu- We have primary resource documentation that the name Jack Cannon was yes. there, and it's the same yes. guy. Yes. Oh I mean, well, see that immediately bumps it up the credibility scale for me. You know. For sure, yeah, if, for sure. And, you know, and unless the fact, there was two people named Jack Cannon who were in military intelligence uh, in the 50s, you know what I mean, which is uh, or highly two, doubtful. Or two people named Jack Cannon who were involved with a certain set of of anti-Castro paramilitary operators. That right. is uh, uh, not likely. Yeah, and the same kind of mindset yeah. that the one, the one then had as opposed to the one that's... It's, it's, Doing these uh, anti Castro raids into Cuba, I mean, the mindsets match. You know, very patriotic type of dude, um, badass operator type of dude. You know, the, the type of guy who thought he could get away with this shit and and do something and make these changes. Same kind of mindset. So it's it's all very interesting, but. Um, you got to put Jack Cannon in Dallas, and good luck yep. doing that. Yep, um, that is uh, more work to do, but there's not a lot. But that's on the why guy, I man. thought that document was important, yeah. tying him to Santiago, because if they knew each other, okay, and they they trusted each other that enough to go on raids to, to Cuba with each other, um, it's it's quite possible. That they could have been working together in Dallas that day for the, sure. The thing about that is, and and to to put an exclamation oh. point on your point, uh, I've studied everything I could about Felipe Vidal Santiago. Right? Yeah. Uh, talk to people who are related to people who knew him. Right. Yep. He didn't trust very many people because right. he felt like he had been betrayed at every turn. And March 31st, April 1st in 1963, when he was one of the independent paramilitary operators that got shut the fuck down and confined to his county, again, the betrayal. He didn't trust easily, especially there toward the end of his life, you know, 1963, 1964. Um, his circle was small. And but we have documents supporting the fact that they did go on these raids together. His circle was small, right? Yeah. That's A. B, we have documented facts that Vidal worked with him in the field. Mm-hmm. C, we believe Vidal was in Dallas. And because we know he didn't trust easily and his circle was small, which included Pedro Diaz Lands, Marcos Diaz Lands, Roy Hargraves, Hemming, right? 
I've never yep. really seen anything to make me think that, or or confirming that like Howard or Hall knew him personally. But but that's not, that I, I can't. I don't want to say you can assume that, but um. But well, we can tie pro- them to him probable. through others who are tight with him, right? You it's, know, it's probable. You know, like one, two degrees of separation from Hall for sure through Hemming, just boom, right there. And right. the fact that they ran in the same circles, trained in the same right. camps, right? right? Yeah, yeah, and had some of the same financiers. So yeah, yeah, I'm. Uh, that's you're right. You're 100 percent right about that. We we know they were tight, and we know Vidal didn't trust Easy. <laughs> His circle was small. We believe he was in Dallas. And if Vidal was doing running raids with the guy in 63, unless Vidal had a reason to no longer trust him, which we don't know, there's no way to verify, you know, confirm or deny, Cannon would seem like somebody he would engage in the Dallas action with, right? Yeah, if he trusted him for sure. That's right. That's right. Um, just real quick because it, it's interesting. Um, the other names that Hemming mentioned in that flurry of names where he dropped Jack Cannon's name to uh, 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 Dick Russell in 1976. Sturgis, of course, we know. Um, yeah. uh, Frank Sturgis, the man who is lucky that he wasn't shot by our friend Monica Perez Jimenez back in the 70s because <laughs> she was hanging out there ready to pop his ass. Uh, what is up, Monica? We love you. We love you. Uh, 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 talk to you soon. Uh, Johnny Devereaux, right? The name Johnny Devereaux. Johnny Devereaux actually appears in Richard Sprague's, Richard Sprague's book, The Taking of America, as a possible identification for the Oswald impo- imposter in Mexico City. Hmm. Yep, Hemming dropped his name here. And Herman Marks. I suggest everybody go look up the name Herman Marks. He was Castro's executioner. This dude, fascinating as hell, man. Fascinating as hell, Rob. He was Castro's executioner. He was from the Midwest. He was a convicted child rapist who got out of prison, joined Castro in 1957, um, and was known as the Butcher of La Cabana. Um, That story, and and he ended up Coming back to the U.S., um, a warrant was put out for his arrest for molestation again, and then he disappeared and was never heard from again. Wow. Listen yeah. to this. So I'd never heard of this, dude. Dude, I Google him first thing. First story, story up is Herman Marks, a drifter from Milwaukee, took a boat to Cuba with nothing but a Colt 45 and 400 in cash. His plan to join the revolution. Yep. Wow, and that, uh, this guy needs an entire episode devoted to him. Dude, you might end up doing two. Uh, some of the wow. stuff I read, um, celebrities who came down to visit Ernest Hemingway were yeah. fascinated with him and the executions, <clears throat> and he would invite them in, like Hollywood actresses and movie producers and shit like that, wealthy people who visited Hemingway and they would go down there and watch these executions at night. They did it. They did them in a dry moat around the prison. And his job was if the firing squad didn't kill the guy, he put a bullet to their head with his, with his 45, right? Hundreds, but he would do it anyway, right? (laughs) He would just do it anyway to make sure. Listen to this. Before he was the executioner, he was assigned to a unit led by Shea Guevara, Yep. Uh, which, which suffered the highest casualties in the rebel, rebel army. In the spring of 58, Shea transferred him to Minas del Frio, a rebel stronghold where Marx helped establish a military school and train recruits uh, to repel the impending Operation Finnish Fidel, a mass invasion of the Sierra Mastra by Batista's army. In one skirmish, he broke three teeth on a rock when he tripped leading a charge. In another, he led a group of 18 rebels who disabled and dismantled a 250-man convoy in an ambush. So this guy was a legit bad mofo. Dude, he was a psychopath. This dude, lo- he he enjoyed being the executioner. He loved wow. it. He loved it. Wow. I mean, a sick bastard, dude. Uh, they say hundreds of people, 
Hundreds of oh, people. Yeah. You know? Um, but yeah. Jesus. That is a hell of a history lesson, guys. You can go look up uh, Richard Marx, the butcher of Havana. Maybe we Not will. Not Richard Marx. <laughs> oh, no. Herman Marx. Herman Marx. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean oh. that. I didn't mean that. It don't mean nothing. <laughs> Oh, my Lord. I'll be right here waiting. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll go ahead and finish up then. Uh, I don't want to keep you waiting. But that's pretty much all I had there, Rob, uh, for that. Uh, the <laughs> Herman Marx, man, what a story. Wow, what a story. Um, but, uh, Rob, next, you know what I thought we would get into, bro? It's something we, I, <laughs> always, uh, 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 I said we were going to do, I was going to do, right? Like when we started Quick Hits. You know what was one thing we could do, Rob? And you're like, what? And I was like, man, we could keep people up to date. Bam. Every month on the newest book releases as part of the news and notes aspect of the show. And then I failed miserably at it. And I have failed miserably at it for (laughs) three and a half years. So today we're going to take you through the last three and a half years (laughs) of newly released JFK book. No, Buckley. we're not. We'd be here all day and night. I know. I know. So what I did, though, what I did do, though, what I did do, though, I have a list, a list of 10 recently released and or upcoming, uh, okay. maybe. Anyway, it's a list of 10 books that have been released in the past few months, Rob. I think we would be remiss. Um, the first is an endorsement. Only the first is an endorsement, okay? And I'm, do, I'm doing this whole thing, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, totally objective. Don't have any opinions on the books. Um, just letting you guys know what's out there, by who, that kind of thing. But this first one is an endorsement. I would like to remind you guys to buy Prayer Man, more than a fuzzy picture by our friend Bart Camp. It's a comprehensive work that delves into Lee Harvey Oswald and other Texas School Book Depository employees inside the building during and after President Kennedy was assassinated. Um, He included new and never before published revelations that contrast the altered accounts that were represented before the Warren Commission and challenges many commonly accepted assumptions and interpretations. Our awesome, our buddy Bart. We love Bart. Uh, You guys, if you haven't picked that one up, you need to. Now, Rob, this next one. if, if If Bart hadn't have sent that book to me for free, I would have bought it. Because hell yeah, not only is Bart a good friend of this show, uh, my show and Doug's show, um, and in you know in in real life we're friendly, um, but <clears throat> Bart is a great researcher, and Bart is a very great linguist and organizer of facts relevant to what he wants to say, and. The book, Prayer Man, More Than a Fuzzy Picture, is a fantastic evidentiary resource. Whether you agree with the premise or not, you can't argue with the facts. And he presents everything in a very uh, comprehensive and and instructive way to support um, his supposition that Oswald was the man in the doorway. And uh, it's so hard to argue with documentation. Um, You know, things point, a lot of these things point one way and one way only, and it's hard to argue with it. So, um, like I said, even if you don't believe that Oswald was the man in the doorway, you need to read the book because much like uh, Harvey and Lee, even if you don't agree with the supposition of the book, you there's so much documentation and interesting uh, facts and documents contained therein that it's just hard to ignore or refute. So kudos to Bart for putting together a, a true masterpiece. And if you haven't got it yet, what are you doing? Go get it. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Bart's a great guy. We love Bart. Um, and I have said before, Rob, before the book was published, I see the book, <clears throat> was born from his online papers, his online work, the anatomy papers, yes. right? Yep. And, dude, before the book was published, I said those anatomy papers on Bart's website 
those essays, that work, that research is the absolute most complete picture of the who and the what and the where inside and outside the Texas School Book Depository before, during, before, during, and after the assassination anywhere on earth. It, period. Yeah. Period. And then he put it in book form and made it better. So, yeah. And, um, and it's very important when you're thinking about uh, the, the, the whole doctrine of the stories of the assassination that we just take for granted our gospel truth. For somebody to say, hey, the second floor lunchroom encounter never happened. But wait, Bart, for 60 years, we've heard that it did happen because of this, because of that, because of this. Well, no, no. Here's proof that it didn't happen because of this and that. And this, I think, is a very important dynamic to keep in mind when you're thinking about these Warren Commission stories that we were all told 60 years ago, because a lot of them were uh, fabricated to implicate Lee Harvey Oswald in the murder of John F. Kennedy. And much like the antics that went on in the Texas theater that day, the so-called second floor lunchroom encounter and things of this nature, the, the whole Oswald interrogation, a lot of the things we've been told for all this time are just not true. And when you can point to primary evidence and documents that refute the truth or the so-called truth, uh, it's very important to do. So that's why I think it's always important to keep an open mind when you're thinking about um, any kind of Warren Commission framing of this whole story because it could be all be horseshit. Amen. Right? And That's it can right. change the perspective of everything forever to find out 60 years later that Oswald <laughs> had an alibi that he that Oswald actually well, claimed that he was out front watching the presidential parade. And this was documented in three separate handwritten notes from the interrogation. And it was withheld all these years. They never told you that Lee Harvey Oswald said he was outside watching the parade when the president got shot. Nobody ever said that. Nope. And and not and 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 then of course Bart found it. Yeah. Handwritten. 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 So the day you, of the assassination. Yep. You start putting all these puzzle pieces together and you you can see how we've been lied to and how the truth has been manipulated behind the scenes. And if we're ever going to get to the bottom of this case, this is the kind of stuff that needs to happen. So kudos, Bart. Um, may, this may be the best single piece of research published on the assassination since Bill Simpich's state secret about 11 years ago, in my opinion. So Agreed. And, and like I say, that, guys, that was the only one of these that is an endorsement. But we had to go all in because it's true. Every damn thing we just said is true. So there we go. Buy the book, please, please, please. You'll learn yes. lots. Uh, the next book, Rob, uh, looks compelling. I actually plan on purchasing this book um, uh, by a fella, uh, 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 associate of the show. We met in D.C. a few years ago. Brian K. Edwards, along with J. Gary Shaw and Ricky White, admitted assassin. I think it was released in January, I believe. Um, uh, the description says, 30 years at the, after the initial Discovery of Roscoe White's naval footlocker, Ricky White, with the help of Gary Shaw and Brian Edwards, have made documented connections between items in the footlocker, a munitions canister, and the events and people surrounding Dealey Plaza. Uh, Says the book also reveals extensive documented evidence regarding Roscoe White. So um, pick that up, guys. Another book that looks very compelling to me, Rob. Uh, is by a lady named Mary Haverstick, a woman mm-hmm. I know, female spies, double identities, and a new story of the Kennedy assassination. Uh, this book apparently is by filmmaker Mary Haver, Haver, Haverstick, and it is about an aviation pioneer named Jerry Cobb. Uh, Haverstick apparently received a mysterious warning from a government agent while working on a biopic of Miss Cobb. 
She dug deeper, discovered that Jerry's life shadowed that of a mysterious CIA agent named June Cop, a name you're very familiar with, Rob. Yes. Uh, so that book is out there. I plan on purchasing that one. Uh, the next one is a book that um, a listener, Mr. Kowalski, alerted me to um, a month ago. We've already discussed it on the show, The Mad Bishops, The Hunt for Earl Anglin James and His Assassination Brethren. Uh, published in November of last year. The description, How did a peddler of phony degrees who claimed to be a world-famous bishop build a network of contacts that led to the assassination of JFK, MLK, and RFK? Uh, the world and the life of Earl James, or Earl Anglin James. We explore the deep inner workings of religion and intelligence, revealing con- connections and relationships that were established Long before Dallas of sixty three, um, yeah. Believe, and if you want to go way back in the archives of the Lone Coming podcast, like TLG back again, baby, into the single digits, maybe even double digits. Uh, there was a show I, I remember called uh, "The Mad Bishops." I did. I think it was no, was it called "The Mad Bishops" or "The Bishops the of New Orleans"? I want to go back and look. You know, I, I'm now that you've that's got me interest, interested. Anyway, did a show long, long ago and came across all this stuff from James or Earl Anglin James, uh, a Canadian who was busted with all these phony paperwork and all this stuff. And you can tie him back to Thomas Beckham, David Ferry, uh, Fred Chrisman, and all this crazy stuff. So, yeah, very interesting. Um, I have to pick that book up and check it out. All right. Um, next. Oh, and thank you again, Mr. Kowalski, for alerting us to that one. Hi, John. Yeah. Hi, John. Let's see, what do we have here next? Oh, next we have a book called The JFK Assassination Chokeholds, recently released. It's an anthology written by Paul Blow, Andrew Eiler, Mark Adamchik, John D'Angelo, and Matt Crumpton. Blumpkin. Um, Yeah. Um, Let's see, this book, let me find Hey, Doug, I had one of them... I had one of those JFK chokeholds on the old uh, trouser snake last night. Well, don't stop till you get enough, buddy. Um, <laughs> but uh, this book, according to the description, and JFK, Jizz was flying everywhere. Uh, you will find up-to-date evidence that would have compelled any jury to conclude that Oswald was not guilty. Clear and convincing evidence of both a conspiracy... Uh, and obstruction of justice to cover it up. Let's see what's next. What we got here? Oh, here's one that apparently I completely missed, Rob, when it came out. Uh, it's hmm. been out since 2021. Thought I'd bring it up. Uh, I believe one of these gentlemen is a listener. It's called JFK Not Closed. Key evidence dismissed, ignored, altered, or suppressed to frame Lee Harvey Oswald. As the lone assassin by Dave O'Brien with Johnny Cairns. Uh, it's Mr. O'Brien's second book on the assassination uh, following 2019's Through the Oswald Window. This one promises stunningly fresh insights, three assassins, conspiracy, and cover up. Johnny Cairns contributes four history challenging chapters uh, on yes. the JFK assassination. Uh, 12 let's... pounds of sausage and an eight pound sack. So there's a lot of info in that book, is what Rob's saying. Uh, we have a book here by uh, called The JFK Assassination, Shades from the Fence, Rob. Yes. Shades from the Fence. I was unaware of this book. Uh, it says here, many books on the Kennedy assassination are from the extreme of a grand conspiracy or a lone nut acting completely alone. This book presents the many variations between and discusses the research community as a whole, uh, apparently, Jerry T. Dealey is a member of the family that Dealey Plaza was made for. So there you go, guys. That's this month's book roundup here on Quick Hits, a JFK assassination research news and notes podcast. And now it's time, Rob, for everybody's favorite portion of well, the Well, hold on, show. Doug. Before we get there, oh, yeah. real quick. Oh, you, I, you forgot one. One. I forgot one. I forgot one. That's right. One. How did I forget? 
You know why? Because I planned to wing it, and it wasn't in my notes. I planned to just throw it to you. I apologize. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here, guys. There's a new book out. There's a new book out, the subject of which is a tremendously large subject of interest for Rob and I going back years. As a matter of fact, Rob and I met in an online forum discussing Lauren Hall. And this book is about Lauren Hall, and it's called Where Was Skip? Tell us about this book, Rob, and the newest episode, bruh, of TLG. That's right. It just dropped this morning. That is March 9th, 2024. We were lucky enough to uh, track down and interview the author, uh, John Limbeck. And it was a fascinating two-hour-plus discussion about his book, Where Was Skip? Uh, pondering the... Uh, let's not assumption, uh, but the speculation that uh, Lauren Hall could have been DB Cooper. That's right. And let's stop. Hang on. Give me a moment, yeah. Rob. Yeah, that's right, guys. Lauren Hall as DB Cooper. Carry on, sir. And now, uh, unless, like I, I'm a very big fan of the db cooper story and investigation and i've been keeping tabs for a lot of years about things and i want to shout out to my buddy darren who does a podcast called the cooper vortex okay and if you want to get into the db cooper uh hijacking and and figure out and try to see who all these different suspects are and find out more facts of the case, I would highly recommend checking out the podcast, The Cooper Vortex. The Cooper Vortex. I am writing that down as yes. we speak uh, because I want to hear that. And uh, let me just shout out to Todd Snyder, his song, D.B. Cooper. Rob, if you've never heard it, you need to hear it. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a it's a very... <clears throat> so, you know, I'm, I may have more knowledge about D.B. Cooper and what... Uh, what his mannerisms were that day, how he acted during the hijacking, how he interacted with the stewardesses and the pilots and the FBI and his demands and his actions that day. And, you know, more than just the average person from listening to all these uh, shows and hearing all these theories and, and doing research and this and that. But yeah, so I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, so, you know, People were sending me the link to this book. Like, can you believe this jackass? Look at, I mean, look at this book. <laughs> you know, can you believe this dumb shit? You know, Rob, Rob. And I'm sitting here and I'm looking at it and I follow the link. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I make a confession? Sure. I, ro- I rolled my eyes too when I saw the cover. But yeah, but yeah. I'm 20. That was, that's an initial reaction. I'm 20 on the way to work or on the way here to the studio, which on the way to the studio, um, I'm 22 minutes in, 22 minutes into your show. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, not, not rolling my eyes. I'm, I'm being, I'm being objective. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, just from talking to the author, he's not saying definitively, hey, D.B. Cooper was Lauren Hall. He's asking the question, and based on what we know about Lauren Hall and what he was able to find out and his ex- exclusive interviews with Hall's family. Hey, man, and- which, hey, let's be fair. Let's be fair, right? You yeah. and I believe Hall was probably involved in Dallas, right? But what we do is ask that question based on what we know about Hall and about the event. What he's if he's just asking the question based on what he's learned about Hall and the event, the Cooper hijacking, he's doing the same thing we're doing. That's it. Right. Yeah. I'm hip. Because the title of the book comes from Lauren Hall's stepson. Yeah. And he said, you know, they they were talking when the D.B. Cooper uh, hijacking went down in an interesting thing in November 21st or 20, was it 24th of 1971, which is very close, of course, 
to the JFK assassination anniversary. Yeah. Um, yeah. Two days. I, the first, man, I was he in said the, the first thing that jumped into his brain was where was Skip? Hey, man. <laughs> right? I, I was in the truck this morning when I, I heard you guys say November 24th. And I'm like, damn, celebrating? <laughs> you know, that's sort of what popped into my head. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so when you take into consideration all the facts that we know about Lauren Hall, all the facts that we know about D.B. Cooper, D.B. Cooper's actions and mannerisms, he had ties to, to Washington and Tacoma. He had previous military experience. This is this is something that Lauren Hall definitely could have pulled off, no questions asked. Um, you physical know, description is, is close, you know, and yeah, go ahead, what? I was just gonna say it was it's such a great show what I've heard so far, um, but like like it's funny like I was born in seventy one and I and your guest made mention that that DB Cooper walked into the airport dropped a twenty dollar bill on the counter and bought his airplane ticket you know and I'm like yeah that's crazy to me that you could do that back then but I that stuck out to me yeah. this morning so far very twenty two minutes in great show and I'll listen and, to the rest you know, on the way home yeah you could walk in with a briefcase that had a bomb in it <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Or, or or something that resembled a bomb, um, you know, because that's how he got the crew to basically do what he wanted. I know. He, and nowadays we worry that TSA is going to pull us out of line because we've got too many fucking charger cords in our carry on. Right. Yeah. And you know. something interesting that we kind of touched on in the show, but we didn't really go into depth um, is, is the fact that the, the, the morning that this happened. OK. Uh, the head of one of the airlines was actually meeting with R Richard Nixon, and the topic of discussion was was how to de deter these hijackings or how to stop them. And then this happens that day, right? So th not only is there a thought that possibly th that this is something that Lauren Hall or whoever was D.B. Cooper uh, took a took a took it upon themselves to do, you know, to get money, right, is the possibility that this was a clandestine operation in order, you know, kind of like a false flag, if you will. Yeah. Kind of like yeah. Operation Northwoods kind of thing, where um, somebody within the government – um would have figured, okay, who can we get to do some crazy shit like this? I, all right, hold on. To, for, to, Lauren Hall. The, to force the hand. <laughs> right. With this to, legislation, to, yeah. 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 Because this was the first time, um, you know, there had been some hijackings in the past, but it was mostly like, hey, take me to Cuba type of thing. There was never like a heist involved where the, where the person, the hijacker actually got away with $200,000, which in 1971 was a lot of money. Um, you know, it's, it would have probably been comparable to a couple million nowadays. Um, yeah. and so, you know, the supposition that this was done is kind of like a false flag to inflict stricter, stricter, uh, rules by the FFA for flying and, 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 and all of this to help curb these hijackings. Um, cause they didn't want to look like, you know, they were imparting all these, uh, restrictions and rules and this and that for 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 flight because like i said even back back then you walk up pay for cash for your ticket you didn't have to give them your id you could walk yeah. on with whatever you wanted to walk on with and you know gun a bomb whatever nobody frisked you you didn't go through a metal detector um didn't go through an x-ray machine nothing like that so you know Kind of like how everything changed after nine eleven. I think that's what they were kind of looking to do uh, after the whole DB Cooper thing. Which it, there were stricter things that went into place after this hijacking for sure. But uh, all in all, you know, when you when you think about DB Cooper and his mannerisms and how he was described by the people who were on that plane by the crew, and the more I, and what we know about Lauren Hall, the more I sat there and thought, you know what. I could see this guy doing this. I could see him remaining cool, calm, and collected. I could see him making the stewardess light his cigarettes for him. You know, hey, I could. I, dude, <laughs> let me let me tell you, the dude had a a, a habit 
of putting himself in dangerous situations by choice. Right. <laughs> His whole life. I can see him saying? jumping out of an airplane at yeah. night, you know, telling me, hey, look, fly at this, fly at this level, maintain it, maintain this speed. And all right, everybody go up to the cockpit. I'm be back here strapping up the parachute, the money and jumping out into the night and getting away, never to be seen again. So I can see Hall doing something like that. If he was desperate enough for money uh, or he was contracted to do so, whatever the case may be. Hey man, uh, with DB Cooper, but yeah, the, the guy was a was a was a he did he's done he did crazy shit all his life, you know he yeah. did crazy like towing, you know twenty millimeter, <laughs> twenty millimeter anti aircraft cannons, you know on a trailer hitched to a fifty eight Oldsmobile across the country along with guns and rifles and shit like that. I mean, the the guy. Look at look at what what a, he got arrested for in the eighties, you know, right? Um, manu, Manufacturing big old meth operation to help fund the Contras. I mean, he's done crazy shit his entire life. It, you can't put anything past Lauren Hall, you know. Right. I'm certainly prepared to not put the Kennedy assassination past Lauren Hall, <laughs> you know. Um, right. So why should D.B. Cooper be any different? Well, I'm, I'm interested to hear the rest of your show and read the book, for sure. Uh, yes. Very interested. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can't wait to listen, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen yep. to the rest when I leave here on the way back home. So, yep. Definitely Hell check yeah. that out. Check and, it uh, out. Check out the book. You know, the book goes way into more detail. But uh, and today, very interesting. Today is March 9th um, when we're actually recording this. So that... that it, March 9th, this episode went up. And what was the author's name again, uh, Rob? John John Lindback. Lindback. And it's called Where Was Skip by John Lindback. Yep, L-I-M-B-A-C-H, Lindback. Lindback. Where Was yeah. Skip? And this concludes Quick Hits Book Roundup. There we go, Rob. You know what that means. It is time for the emails. Are you ready? Ready, sir. Let's do it. Emails on Quick Hits. And I got one last minute, Rob, this morning from a listener. Uh, I'll throw in at the end. Cool? Sure. All right. All right. <clears throat> Let me feel around in my sack here. Mm. Man. Any nodules down there? Yeah, uh, there's a couple. Definitely a couple. A couple of wrinkles, a couple stray hairs. Uh Oh, and a couple emails. Looky here. Everybody gets those stray hairs, man. All right. First up, we got an email. Doesn't matter if you're black or white. Everybody gets them. That's right. Uh, from Craig Patterson. What's up, Craig? He says, Dear Doug and Rob, hey, you might man. find this interesting. Uh oh. And then there's a YouTube link. Oh. Which doesn't always translate too well to podcast form. But uh, l let me just follow this YouTube link and see where it takes me, Doug. Okay. Hold on one second. So I know what we're getting ourselves into here. All right, we got to get past the thing. Let me guess. It's the Jackson 5 on Merv Griffin, 1974. Mm, no. This is Harvard's. Oh, far out, yeah. It's a uh, Harvard's UFO lawyer, aliens, disinformation, and the secret government. And they're interviewing Danny Sheehan. Did he say aliens in the secret government? Yes. Uh, Craig, you said we might be interested. Uh, nah. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Well, Dan Daniel Sheehan, in all fairness, has done some work on the JFK assassination. Very yes, interesting. Yeah, work. I covered his, uh, me and uh, Ted Rubenstein and I, maybe five, six years ago, we did a real long show where we went through his presentation, the S-Force, you know, that thing that's online, yeah. his big long thing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. We went through that and talked about that in a lot of detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know the, Danny Sheehan. He's, he's done with the Pentagon Papers and Watergate and all that stuff, so could be some interesting stuff there, but... Let me see. Back to the email. He says, The supposed topic is UFOs, but the conversation soon veers off in different directions. Sheehan provides his view of what happened regarding the assassination of JFK 
focusing heavily on the figure of Felix Rodriguez. I love your shows and thanks for all your work delivered with your customary rigor and a welcome big dose of humor. Best wishes, Craig Patterson. Craig gets it. Craig, thank you so much. Uh, no disrespect there uh, with the alien thing. I just kind of stay away from that stuff. But Sheehan, yes. Done some quality work. He not only He's done some quality work, but like the rest of us, you know, he's made some mistakes down the, down the line, too. I certainly have. But, uh, yeah, yeah, done some quality work there. Yeah, and as far as Felix Rodriguez goes, <laughs> you know, this <laughs> – this is this is where we veer off into the George H. W. Bush topic and well, this and that and the other. But yeah. he was part of this initial cadre of Amworld guys. Yeah. Um that are very interesting. Um so yeah, uh now as far as Rodriguez being involved Yeah versus no having knowledge of because of his connections and other people he's worked with, that's a different story. That knowledge of, that's a different, you know, kettle of fish. You know what I'm saying? Um, versus involvement. Like, knew, right. the, knew who did it, knew how it was done. And that's what I mean by yeah. involvement. If you're talking yeah. about him being involved, then you're talking George H.W. Bush involvement. And what... You know, but a working, you know how we feel about that. Yeah, but a working history somewhere down the line with some people, some of the people who may have been involved in the operation is not out of the realm of possibility whatsoever. So, yeah. All right. Next up, we have an email from Graham. Uh, he says, hello from Scotland. Hello, Graham from Scotland. Graham loves quick hits. He loves the lone gunman and he loves the Dallas action. He says, you get, you keep me company all day when I'm painting and decorating. So I thank you for that. Well, it's man, truly that's, our pleasure. That's cool as hell, man. I like that thought, you know, Graham's like, like making improvements on a place, man, making a place happier, brighter, getting a fresh coat on it and then jamming with us. Thank you, bro. Thank you so much for listening. Yep. It's almost as good as the mental picture of Caroline listening to us as she does her cleaning and vacuuming. Uh, So you're very close, Graham, a close second. Is she wearing, like, baggy pajama pants when she's doing this? No, I'm not even going to go there. I'm going to stop. It doesn't matter what she's wearing. (laughs) We love you, Caroline. Yoga pants? You are a smoke show. Dude, you're killing me over here. Wow. That's my job. Man, I want to rock with you. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Rob, that, that last comment was aimed at Caroline, not you. Don't. Rob, you are a, Rob, you are a smooth criminal. I know. I know. I try. I try. Sorry, Graham. I pictured, <laughs> sorry, Graham. Yeah, you're a close second when you're painting and decorating. We, no, I mean, much, sorry we got in the tomfoolery during his... Oh, never mind. Go ahead, Rob. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Back to the email. Whew. Sorry. Man. Rob's distracted. I need that... Oh, yeah. I need that... Guys, this is just to me and Rob. Listeners, don't listen to this part. Right now, I need that <laughs> Theo Vaughn soundbite I told you about before the show. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, man. Let's get a little hot in here, bro. We may just have to Oof. forget Graham's email. Oh, it's not Graham's email. It's Caroline in yoga pants. Good lord! Oh. All right, I, I picture the. Tra- I picture. Let me try to get through you're, this. You're here. picturing Caroline in yoga pants is what you're picturing. Yes, while she's vacuuming. Yes. And I, the rug is very dirty. Um. She has really put in a little uh, lake work to. All right, sorry. All right, I digress. I picture the triple <laughs> Caroline. We love you. <laughs> uh, apparently. Yeah, she she. You better put her at the entrance to this uh, this episode now. Oh, she's she's every episode. Okay, I just good, I just good. go back and forth between the the two intro intros that she's she's so graciously and wonderfully put together for us in her home yes. studio. Absolutely. She, uh, it, um, you hear my buddy Gregory at the beginning, then you hear Caroline at the beginning of every show. Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay, let me try to get through this. I'm sorry, Graham. <laughs> I'm 
all fucked up now. Okay, I pictured the triple B and Doug walking along a beach. Well, there's a different mental image. Boy, this just got creepy. <laughs> are we holding hands in this? In the, what are we doing here? Um. Uh. Jesus Christ. I pictured the triple B and Doug walking along a beach, and there sticking out of the sand is a lamp, Doug. You guys rub the lamp. Are we rubbing it together? Or am I rubbing your hands as you rub the lamp? What are we doing here? Uh, wait, right, wait, so wait, rub- wait, 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 wait. What? <laughs> wait. <laughs> Holy sweet wonder fuck. Go ahead, Ron. <laughs> All right, we're rubbing this lamp, Doug. And the <laughs> and the ghost of LBJ flies out and says, Ha ha <laughs> says what? Ha 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 He says, Ha 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 so he's, I grant he's you, Woody I know what my three, <laughs> <laughs> I damn, I know what one of my three wishes is going to be right now. Okay. Um, uh, he grant, he says, ha ha. <laughs> I grant you the power of time travel. Oh, we don't get three wishes. We get the power of time travel then, Doug. Okay. 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 But, but you can only go back to 22 November 1963. I'd go. You can only stay for one minute. You can't touch anyone or anything. And you cannot change the outcome of the day. Where do you stand for that one minute? The roof. Where would you the be, roof, guys? All the best, Graham. The roof of the Dallas County Records building. Whew, man, that's a tough one. That's it, dude, right there. That, I'm going to walk around the that's corner. That's a good spot. I'm going to see Lawrence Howard on his belly with a tripod and that Johnson rifle. And then that's I'm probably, a good spot. And then, I'm, and then if I'm only got a minute, I figure I got. Here's two, what I do. I got 20 seconds to see him. And then because it's Lawrence Howard and he has guns, I've got 40 seconds to run around like a crazy man on that roof trying not to get killed until I'm <laughs> zipped back to the to the present day. Here's what I do, Doug. I'd stand down on Elm Street. Right. Okay. I would be roughly in the same position as the apron man. You know who I'm talking about, right? Yes, yes, yes. So he's standing on the other side of Elm Street, right at, right after Kennedy comes out from behind the Stemmons Freeway sign. Okay. <clears throat> so from that angle, you would have a fucking sweet line of sight to the sixth floor because whoever if anybody or whoever was up there tucked back in that corner you could see him from that angle okay yeah so that's where i would park myself right there and i would be looking up at the sixth floor at that window seeing if i could see anything or who was up there at the time and as soon as that fucking shot went off after i determined that because we only have a minute so as soon as that shot goes off, and then or the three shots, I should say, after the third shot, because that will satisfy my curiosity, part of my curiosity. The next thing I would do is sprint across the street to the grassy knoll as fast as I could, just burning ass, just to see what's going on up behind there to see if I could see anything or anybody. Yeah. That's what I would do in my minute in Dealey Plaza. Well, you obviously, uh, you got to think about it longer than I did. But, uh, yeah, yeah, man, uh, I like that plan. In that case, I would, I, we would go together and I would be with you. Or would we split up and, like, I go to the roof of the county records building looking down on Dealey Plaza to see what I could see while you're in Dealey Plaza? I would think we'd probably, if we're holding hands walking down the beach, we rub this lamp. Obviously, we're going to hold hands when we time travel. Yes. Oh, we well, could be yeah. holding hands on Elm Street. I'll be focused on the sixth floor of the book depository. You be focused on the roof of the of the county records building. Or 
fifth floor of the is it the northwest side, the other side? Or is it the which of side? The Dow Techs? Of no, the the depository. You said one of us could be concentrating on the sixth floor, but we would be a floor down in the opposite window, right? Yeah. And then we yeah. could break I'll head for the grassy knoll and you head for the county records building. Yeah. And we'll see if we can see what we can see in a minute before we get zapped back to the beach. Why is why is LBJ's ghost naked and hung like a freaking mule? Uh man, that I think that says more about old Graham than uh, us. <laughs> Uh, well, that's just how I imagined it. Oh, um, okay. Now I apologize, Graham. I'm sorry. That says more about you, <laughs> Rob. Yeah. <laughs> that is absolutely 100 percent only how you imagined it. I promise, buddy. Yeah, I know. All right. Next up, uh, this is not quite an email, but uh, I was messaged on Instagram by uh, a fellow. And I don't even know his name, um, so I'm not going to out him here. Um, but he is one of our heroes, Doug. One of one uh, of our heroes, but we don't want to name him. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm confused. Don't want to name him. Um, I was trying to see if I still had the audio. Let me take a look. See real quick. So do we play like an interview or something of him, of this person? No, no, no. One of our heroes. It's not. It's not the guy that makes uh, Momo's sausage and provolone sandwiches before the show, is it? <laughs> no, dude, you would not believe. Uh, that's right. I'm talking about you, you fat fuck. I'm talking about you. You would not believe how much more like easy to get along with Momo is after he has that provolone and sausage in the morning. Uh, he's like a whole different person. Isn't that right, Momo? Hey. Uh, hey. Hey. I didn't, I say, I gave you a talk back button. I didn't say you could use it. Well, I don't, I don't have the audio anymore handy, okay. but uh, let me just read what he sent me. He says, cause obviously he's heard us talking about him. Um, oh, we've talked about him and he's one of our yeah. heroes. Yes. <laughs> I am absolutely, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, can't wait for this. He says, hi, Rob. I'm a longtime listener, and I am so appreciative of your deep dives. I think it was some of the gunship cowboys as well. Anyway, I heard you refer on a recording you played saying something like Huntley on tape being rude. He says, I was there. And I am the one heard on the video telling Huntley and the other one to be quiet. Oh, my God, buddy. Let me. <laughs> wow. Get this. Robert Groden was speaking and yes. receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award. Right. Right. And it started when it started. Deb Conway was on, at the podium talking about uh, important women to research through the years since 1963 she was in the middle of speaking about and paying tribute to her late sister, Sherry Feaster, with tears coming down her face when these fucking jerkbags started that bullshit. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. He says uh, Huntley and the other one were getting shit-faced, loud, and absolutely appalling grandiosity. I heard them say a week or two after laughing about how they got kicked out of the conference. Man, and fucking... And you know what that is? That's a motherfucker don't know how to act. Period. That's a that's a that's that's an asshole that don't know how to fucking act. It's probably why he spends a lot of time alone in front of a computer screen on YouTube because nobody ex nobody invites him any fucking where. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. He says and then and then said how it was his house or something like that on one of the November early December shows. So basically. You know, they were saying that it was their house and how, you know, they got kicked out of their house, you know, because they made the conference, basically. Man, fuck all that. I mean, people came there to hear Groden and Hancock. Man, fuck. Fuck his house. Yeah, they, Dude, didn't, they didn't come there to meet you two douchebags. Everybody associated with it has 
talked about this very fucking episode in absolute, absolute most derisive manner possible. Your fucking house, man. Come on, dude. Come on. <laughs> I, there's a different look. That was a that was a that was a situation of conspiracy buffs invading an historical research conference is what happened. Right, and not knowing how to uh, conduct yourself in and an adult manner, dude. Dude, dude. Is it- I've seen I've seen dudes getting arrested for DUI on cops act more civilized. Right. He says, anyway, I was there and I was so embarrassed oh, yeah. for, our, for our community that these guys have become somewhat prominent in the community. And he says, anyway, I've been wanting to write you for a while. I have photos from me talking my way into Clay Shaw's 1313 Dauphine Street. If you oh, care to check. shit. <laughs> so I said, uh, oh, so you're the guy. That's awesome and well done, sir. Kudos wow, to you man. for standing up and telling them guys to shut the fuck up. Absolutely stay in touch, buddy. Sitting and um Um He's got a very cool Instagram account where he goes around to some of the sites, uh historical sites in Dallas and New Orleans. So if you want to go give him a follow, go follow Solo Sojournist. On Instagram, there you and give go, him a follow. Man. Telling him, tell him quick hits. Robin Doug sent you, and tell him what how much you appreciate uh, him shouting down the two drunk assholes at the Lancer Conference meant to you because it meant a lot to us. So God bless you, Solo Sojournist, all one word, Solo Sojournist. Absolutely, man. And I think I, I, uh, I said. Uh... As thanks at the next Lancer, I can't remember if it was a cup of coffee or a Coke Zero, but dude, on me, or breakfast, on me for that, for what you did, telling uh, Peckerhead to shut the fuck up already. And um, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people don't know this, but Chuck O'Celli's uh, sometime co-host, I believe on Friday night, B. Pete, right? Uh B. Pete, he's a he's a big old boy. I don't mean he's like I'm just saying big old arms, right? A lot of people don't know this, and it, he did it in a much quieter, much more private way. But he went to <laughs> them at one point too and explained to them that if he had to come the fuck back and shut him up, it was going to be ugly. <laughs> he he did that too, and I'm telling you, man, I wouldn't want B. Pete to hit me. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Props to B. Pete yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, but you, homie. The, the Instagram homie who told him to shut the fuck up. You are the man. Thank you for listening. Thank you for studying with us. We appreciate you. We appreciate you what you did. And, man, that sport jacket you had on at Lancer that night at the banquet fucking was the bomb, dude. The thing was popping. I dug it. Cool. <laughs> um, but, hey, I got an email, Rob. Uh, late, late. Yes. Uh, this is from a listener. I got that this 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 morning, as a matter of fact. From Corey um, says, uh, oh, shit. dear guys, love all three shows. Just wanted to say how <laughs> how Doug and Joe need to convince the big bad Triple B to get his ass to Dallas next year for Lancer. He can be present when the Joey Scars gets his revenge, <laughs> conquering the scooter and witness Joe right around the Lancer parking lot with all of the Lancer smoking crowd to see. Or he could just come hang with his friends. I will be there. Hope to see you, Joe, and the Triple B signed Corey Treverson. So thanks for the thanks for the email there, Corey. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Corey. I'm just glad it wasn't Corey freaking Hughes. <laughs> That's where I thought you were going with this. Oh my God, man. That's Joe ca- man. Joe called him out on the show to fight him if he comes to Lancer. So hey, I, was, I didn't know where this email was going. Hey, Corey Hughes. Corey Hughes gets the gas face. <laughs> All right. Dude, you about ready to wrap this one up? Absolutely. All right. You go first, and Momo will start the music, and I'll find where I am in my notes. Please proceed, sir. Yes, for all things the Lone Gummin, if you'd like to watch us like we're on TV or something, like on video, head to YouTube and search for the Lone Gummin Podcast, and you'll find us. And when you do... 
make sure you hit the subscribe button, please. And if you enjoy the work we're doing over there, hit the like button on the video. That's all. Leave a comment. Interact. We'd love to talk as long as you're not an asshole. For the audio version, <laughs> wherever podcasts are listened to, whether it be iTunes, whether it be Spotify, whether it be uh, uh, Amazon, whether it be Spreaker. And if you listen on Spreaker, I get an extra penny for, for listening. Ah, uh, there you go. That's what I'm going to do. So, now. hey, yeah, support us wherever you can hear uh, the show. It's greatly appreciated. Just search for the Lone Gummit Podcast and you shall find it. Douglas! And you can catch my show, The Dallas Action, presented by Wall Street Window, all over the place. I recommend Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. But if you simply enter it into your search engine of choice, you will find a couple of hundred episodes of detailed, informed, critically thought out and analyzed historical research and study of the people, places, things, events, and ideas connected to the conspiracy-driven assassination of John F. Kennedy like this show. It is another fine podcast from Drop Deep Podcast Productions in the heart of Music Row, Music City, USA. So for Rob Clark and Momo Scaranucci, this is Doug Campbell saying tune in again next time when, upon being asked how long he spent actually vetting the Bill Harvey took a flight from Rome to Dallas story before before he decided that it must be true, we'll hear author David Talbot say. I would say probably four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that Ooh. explains a lot. We are Sounds out. Sounds about right. Peace. Go buy some Silk City hot sauce. <laughs>